Hey everybody, this is Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design, and welcome to Interior Design's Best of Design 2020, a two-week-long online design celebration honoring the best of the best in design. A combination film festival, awards platform, thought leadership, and a big old bash bringing the community together. So exciting, right? As we all know, this year, everyone in the universe has had to reimagine just about everything in our professional and personal lives, from how we collaborate to how we engage and come together. I am proud to report our beloved industry, all of you out there, have responded with incredible ingenuity, creativity, passion, and innovation. I mean, what can I say? I'm not surprised at all. At Interior Design, we understand how important it is to come together as a community and honor you and your incredible achievements. Frankly, this year, more than ever. So since we can't celebrate in person and you guys know how I miss you all so very much, we are bringing the community to you. So virtual, here we come. Speaking of all things virtual, this year, as you know, the Sandow Design Group, including Interior Design, our family at Metropolis and Lux, introduced Design TV by Sandow, an online video network with daily programming for designers and design enthusiasts. All you guys out there, introduced in the spring of 2020, it was our answer to inspire, connect, and engage with you. And boy, did we ever. Within its first eight months, listen to this, you guys, Design TV has experienced over 7 million views and over 31 million impressions. Wowza. You're not only tuning in, but you're also clicking, commenting, engaging with one another. I love that. And DMing me all the time, telling me things like interior design continues to lead to be your source for information and inspiration whether it's in print or digital. So it's with your comments in mind, we will continue to share your optimism about the future of our industry. Heck yes. So let's talk best of design 2020. Here's a glimpse of what you can look forward to for the next two weeks. Okay, day one, that's today. We're kicking it off with the Hall of Fame Roundtable a thought-provoking discussion with a select group of Hall of Famers on the future of design. And then, drum roll please, we premiere our Hall of Fame Film Festival today and over the next three days. We'll end week one on Friday by partnering with IIDA and bringing together leaders in the design industry for an open dialogue on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We call it Design Unity. I am so very proud to co-host this important and ongoing conversation with my dear friend and Hall of Famer, Cheryl Durst, the Executive VP and CEO of IIDA. So that's Friday, December 4th. What a week, but that's not all. Then the following week, next Monday, December 7th, join me for another exciting week. This time to celebrate the Best of Year Awards. I mean, it's almost too much goodness, right? Check this out. Monday, our first ever Best of Student Awards. Then Tuesday, Best of Year Products. We've got Best of Year Projects on Wednesday from literally all around the globe. Thursday, and also brand new this year, because you deserve the recognition, Best of Year People. I can't wait. And then Friday, a Best of Year Marathon, so you can just binge on the whole week, all in one shot. Now, before we get started, I want to give a sincere thank you to all of our 2020 Hall of Fame sponsors. We have Benjamin Moore, thank you. Material Bank, our good friends at Material Bank, thank you. Hall of Fame Roundtable sponsors, Material Bank, Mecco plus SWF Contract, Neocon, William Sonoma, Pottery Barn, Tucci, and Benjamin Moore. And a special thank you to our friends at Turf who made this backdrop just for me. I mean, come on, check it out. It's so fitting that it's Hall of Fame, like 
Oscars of our industry, and it's called Crown Tile. <laughs> right? Don't you love it? It's fresh from the Turf R&D page. Now, I know you're going to ask me about it, so here's the spec. It's 9 millimeter felt material. It comes in like 30 colors. And even though I wanted all one color, it's multi-layered. So the back plane can be one and the protrusions another. Pretty great, right? This looks like we're celebrating Hall of Fame. Next up, the Hall of Fame Roundtable, followed by the premiere of our Hall of Fame Film Festival. And don't forget to register for the Hall of Fame Cocktail Party in partnership with Hayworth. That's taking place this afternoon. And you know we know how to throw a party. I think we're live right now. Um, it's Best of Design 2020, a two week long design event honoring the best of the best in design. Now, it's a combination film festival, awards platform, thought leadership, and a big old bash bringing the community together. How are you all out there, out there, wherever you are? I know you're watching on Facebook and on Interior Design. Um, by the way, ask questions and we'll get some in the chat for you, okay? All right, I'm bringing in, it's day one. We're starting right now today and we're kicking off these next two weeks with a thought provoking roundtable discussion with a few of our illustrious Hall of Famers on the future of design. And I'm just looking at them all and I am so honored to be with all of you today. I think you're all coming up. Hi guys, hey everybody. Okay, everyone has to unmute now. <laughs> Uh -oh. <laughs> we had a lot of okay, everyone out there. We had a lot of instructions to do. Okay, we had to go <laughs> on and on. It was a lot of a lot of schmagooging around. So, but these are my amazing friends. I am so be, I am so honored to be in your presence. Honestly, you guys. Uh, all right, let me let me do a, a little introduction. Okay, first. All right, first we have Clive Wilkinson, the Clive Wilkinson in LA, President Design Director of Clive Wilkinson, an architect and designer who collaborates with forward-thinking clients envisioning new creative communities. Hi, Clive, how are you? Hi, Sandy, I'm very honored and, and delighted to be here. You guys, you guys are the first, the first, you know, the first table that we're not really around, but we're kind of around for our <laughs> best of design 2020. So it's kind of, it's kind of amazing. I'm like really excited. Okay, and then we have Colin Berry, design director and principal of Gensler. He calls himself a soft modernist at heart and works for the number one giant firm in our industry. And he's in London now. How are you, Colin? I am great, thank you. It is really wonderful to be here. So, so lovely. All yeah. right, then we have Cloda, only one name, one, one name for her, one name for the <laughs> firm. And she's always believed that good design supports well-being. Decades before it became a thing, she definitely is a pioneer. Cloda, how are you? Oh, it's so glad to be here with you all. I just I wish I just I missed I'm the so hugs. Excited. I missed the hugs, you know. I know. <laughs> I know. Me too. Me too. Well okay. sanitized hugs going out to all of you. Yes. Going yeah. out. We're sending big hugs to everybody. All right. So now we have Hagi Bellsberg. Oh, Hagi. Oh my God. So Hagi has an amazing portfolio, architecture and interiors. He's always using unconventional methodologies, always pushing those boundaries. And I believe he's in Hawaii right now. <laughs> Hi, Hagi. Hi, Cindy. Thank you so much for allowing me to join. I'm in Hawaii working on a project, but took a little excursion yesterday and got hit in the head. So 
I'm oh here and very excited. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, you know, that's that's the good thing about Zoom. We sort of like blur out a little bit. It's still gorgeous <laughs> to me. I don't know. <laughs> All right. And then we have the double, double Deborah's. So first we've got Deborah Burke, partner of Deborah Burke Partners. She's an architect, educator, and the dean of the Yale School of Architecture. She designs everything institutional, residential, commercial. Hi, Deborah. I'm so, so happy to see you. Hi, Cindy. I just missed the real life hug and I'm happy to be with all these wonderful Oh, colleagues. yes, the virtual <laughs> have to do. And then my very, very good friend, Deborah Lehman Smith, um, senior partner at Lehman Smith McLeish. She's a leader in workplace design, undertaking ambitious projects around the globe. This girl is always traveling and she is also seriously committed to the arts, all her projects, serious art. I love her. Hi, Deborah. I, I love you too. And I love the double Debras. <laughs> yeah, I know. I did like a little double Debras. I know it's good. I know. <laughs> all right. So, all right, you guys, a, co a couple things. First of all, we're not together. This is the week of Hall of Fame. Isn't it like kind of insane? Can we just like pine a little bit together? Yeah. Poggy pine with me. <laughs> <laughs> it's... It's extraordinary. It was our daily, it was our yearly pilgrimage. It was our, it's what every, every year we look forward to do. And it's, it's very sad. I, I have to say it's very, very sad. And I'm, I, I see how much I appreciate and miss at the same time, this time of year and being with all of you. I know I missed you guys. I miss you guys so much. Look, I'm wearing, I got the red backdrop, you know, so I'm like in the hall of fame thing that's going on. And, you know, and best of year right after it. And it's all, it's all crazy. So we're doing these two weeks, two weeks Hall of Fame this week. We end with a day of um, design unity with IIDA and my good friend, Cheryl, Cheryl Durst. And then next week, it's all best of year. And we did, and um, Deborah, you'll like this too. We did a whole, this is new, a best of day of best of year students. Then we do product, then projects, and then people. We added people. And then like a whole marathon at the end. So we're like crazy. <laughs> you know, Cindy, and I was saying the other day that this is like a long sentence with no proper punctuation, you know, the, being stuck with COVID. But yeah. you're giving a very good punctuation of energy and light here. Go for it, girl. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, it, it, is, it is something that, you know, if someone had told me like, you can have a year off of Hall of Fame. Like maybe in a typical year, I'd be like, oh, like, what could I do? <laughs> now it's like, oh my God, I miss it all so much. And okay, you know, so we've been out long enough to make a baby. We're nine months in here. We could have. Wow. I, mean, I know, I know. It's, it's kind of, it is kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. So let's, let's talk about first, first let's talk about how um, all of you are doing. Um, Deborah, I, unmute my darling Deborah and and tell us and, and tell us how your firm is doing. Me, Deborah? Yes, <laughs> you, oh, yes Deborah. sorry, I'm, I'm looking, yes, yes, you, Deborah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm in my office right now, which is a great thing. That's cool. And so our firm's doing fine. I, like it, I, we all got to chat beforehand and I think we just have to be super optimistic and we have to keep going with design excellence. I know this is a really sad year, but we're gonna love next year that much more. And your leadership to do this, I mean, maybe this year it's more accessible to everybody. So we're just keep pushing on and our clients and yeah, it's way harder for sure, but maybe it's better at the end. You know, we have to believe that. Yeah, yeah, Th thank you for that, by the way. That is like for us, the silver lining is that like it made us pivot and find different ways to share you to like a bigger audience. And so we're like kind of excited about that. Um, okay, so uh, not that we'll do Deborah's and Deborah's the whole time, but, <laughs> but we're okay with it. Just because we're kind of on. in love with the idea. We uh, said we yeah. could even answer for each other. We're okay. Yes, exactly. I yeah. love that. And Deborah, and how are you doing? I think you need to pronounce them a tiny bit differently because uh, there's a Deborah with an H on the end. So, so it's the bar. That's true. Well, you can pronounce it and, and it would sound beautiful. So. Yeah, you say it, Clive. It's, uh, both of our names sound gorgeous. That's I know. <laughs> I, want, I want to ask a question. Is the D&D building named after you guys? <laughs> 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 now, there's an opportunity. 
Thank you. For That's that. a good one. Um, uh, so, Deborah, Deborah, how, so, how are you doing? How, how's your business and how are your folks doing? How are your clients? Uh, business is good. Uh, clients are good. And, and I too, you know, it's one, missing the fall season, missing all the events in New York, but sensing just in the way the phone has been ringing, more inquiries, more people wanting to start stuff up right now. I'm really feeling an, a kind of the nine month optimism. People are, okay, we got this and now we're looking forward. So things are good. Things are good. Yeah, Clive, you had that too, because I remember, like, look, it was horrible for all of us, everything stopped, but then all of a sudden, you know, we have these waves, but things are opening up for your work as well. We def are definitely sen sensing new opportunities uh, right now, and some very, very interesting ones. Um, I can't, as tough as this is, I can't help feeling it's really good for us. Mm -hmm. um, you get so comfortable with everything in the world. You, you, you get so familiar with, you know, these things that you do. And then in many senses, uh, you know, you spend some of your life getting quite spoiled by uh, circumstances. And when something like this happens, you start to re, I think you start to reevaluate uh, your life and what you're doing and uh, how you're interacting with society, how you're, you know, uh, relating to people in obviously in different ways now. Um, <clears throat> And, and yeah, I think a new appreciation of the people in my firm as well and what they're going through. Um, and yes, it's, it's sort of, I think we, this does sensitize us in many ways. Uh, um, and I, you know, I've always thought that change only happens through stress and this is very stressful, but change is, you know, change is good and it's healthy. Uh, I think this makes us stronger. Um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, yeah, and I think it makes us more empathetic. We've seen amazing things happening in, in the political sphere social political sphere, uh, which really sort of emphasize this issue of empathy um, and connecting with, uh, you know, social issues. So I think there's many good things, you know, as tough as it's been, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's also pretty great. Yeah. Cloda, I, I wanted to, um, I, I always think about you with this because I know that wellness will forever be in our vocabulary, but I do give you a whole lot of credit that you know, I, I, I think that if it wasn't called Feng Shui, if it maybe was called wellness when you started, maybe we could have like got on your train a long time ago. <laughs> you mean you mean instead of calling me woo-woo? <laughs> <laughs> and now it's wonderful? Yes, yes. <laughs> We're actually busier than we've ever been. This, this is going to be our biggest year, I think, in our entire entire business because wow. of, you should precisely, be. you should precisely because of the wellness thing. You know, working in Saudi, we're working in Argentina, working all over the states, and uh, people are glomming on to the idea of having, particularly in multifamily buildings, of having amenities where people can go to be well, you know, with the saunas and stuff like that, which will shortly open up. And, and, and uh, also because we're deeply involved with all the landscaping, all the projects we're working on, uh, we're, we're, we're putting a huge emphasis on outdoor spaces, making outdoor rooms. So this goes on with those outdoor heated rooms. You know, Probably one of the biggest things that's happened is this new appreciation for the outdoors mm -hmm. within the cities and, and what Absolutely. the value of that is to us. I love walking the, the, along the sidewalks and seeing all the different restaurants and stuff like that. It's very, it's very lively. It's exciting, yeah. isn't it? You really want to want it to become permanent. Yeah, um, Hagi, you're you're I, I wish it would. sitting outside. <laughs> <laughs> so, Not so today, let's, I mean. let's talk about outside spaces. <laughs> what are you working on? There? I mean, it's I'm. We're working on two projects here, a new house and a renovation of a historic one, which is where I am now. But it's it's true. I, I find myself outside a lot more right now on a personal basis where um, Clive's right. It, it, it changed. Everything changed for us. And we gives us we get to step back to what we perhaps uh, fell in love with this industry. And then it's hands on. It's it's really being part of the creation of the project. So with one project. I'm able to be there morning and night and really, you know, seeing how the environment changes it. And with the historic project, it allows me also to really uh, engage with the materials that we're trying to replicate. But, you know, 
more more so than that, the comment about the uh, street life. Uh, somebody made a comment about um, you know the street life's coming back in Santa Monica on Main Street. They never allowed for restaurants. I don't know why they never allowed for restaurants to have outdoor dining, you know, in a city like Los Angeles, where we would need that kind of village environment. And now they're, they've expanded it. They've allowed for uh, people to have all this outdoor dining. And I agree, I hope it stays because it is robust. It is, it fulfills a, a need that n otherwise planning codes and all sorts of other kind of growth restrictions would have prohibited. And now we're seeing that the people need it, the people want it, the city provided it. And I really hope it doesn't change because finally one small space in Santa Monica has really just blown up as a village and I'm seeing it throughout Los Angeles. And those are the silver linings during these very tough times. Yeah, Colin, let's let's talk a little bit about workplace. I, I, actually, I actually like, I remember so clearly like, I don't know how many months ago I, we, we were chatting and I said, how are things going? You're like, things are going great in London. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so expand on that a little bit. Well, I'd say, um, you know, as a firm, we've actually navigated this very well. Um, and what's been really wonderful to see is I think, you know, exactly like Clive said, you know, I think we've have all learned to have a lot more empathy, right? Including our clients, right? And I think we've really pivoted to design with purpose, right? And our clients have really embraced that. Um, I think that we're fortunate that, you know, we navigated this well, things are really picking up. So we're actually pretty bullish about the future. Um, you know, in London, we actually hired, which is really amazing, you know? So so if anybody's out there that's looking that for- That is amazing, that's out. like amazing, <laughs> hiring, um, hiring. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I th again, I think, you know, we're really optimistic about where things are headed, you know? And what's so amazing about this community, right? Is that we are optimists, right? And so, faced with the challenge, you know, we figure out a way through it and use our creativity to kind of solve the world's thorniest problems, right? And so, you know, again, I think we're really excited about where we're headed, and this industry and the creative minds in this industry can play a major part in, in sort yeah. of taking us forward. So, Deborah, you've had to navigate. Yeah, you've had to navigate not only your business, which. I think the good thing is that you do so many different things, but also um, being the dean at Yale and the whole piece of education, which is definitely complicated. Can you share a little? <laughs> it, it, it has been enormously complicated and a shout out to everybody, wh wh wherever they are in the world in this audience who might be teaching design right now because doing a desk crit over Zoom is not easy. So uh, thanks to everybody uh, in the design education world. Yale reopened uh, under very, very strict protocols and the students were so happy to be able to be in studio and be part of studio culture. And for everybody on this screen whose office is open in some way, I think we feel the same thing, right? Studio culture matters, even if you only do it part-time or a little bit, there's nothing quite like seeing the real brick or touching the real fabric, right? That um, That's part of, um, of this process. Um, I think we too, we've learned to appreciate both in school and in the studio, what you must do in person, that's good, and what you can do remotely, which is also a benefit. So maybe that one day where you fly to Chicago for a 45 minute meeting isn't so necessary and we can get smarter about that stuff, both in terms of the environment and our mental health. And then the stuff where you really do wanna be in person because you are choosing a brick or that matters. I hope among the many positive things we get out of this will be a saner balance of how we use our time and our creativity. Yeah, don't you, don't you think, because you, know, you guys are always so good to your clients, right? And I just use this example all the time because I remember like hearing, you know, architects saying they're like flying to China for a day for a meeting and then coming back. And it'd be like, now, now, as you said, Deborah, maybe it's okay that you're not in person for that meeting, maybe the other meeting, right? And maybe the clients will have a more, you know, sympathy to, you know, your schedule too. I think that, uh, what's really important is to actually be face to face with your clients for the first meeting, rather than if, if it can be possible, just the first meeting so you can collect up that energy and go forward. No, 
it's not easy, but it's we've been trying to do it. <laughs> oh, yeah. De- yeah. I mean, I'm sure all of you would rather be talking to your clients. But yeah, just just from a like you said, like a sustainability and a wellness, like how many times you're traveling, what you need to be at versus what you don't need to be at. Um, Deborah, what you, you travel a lot. Uh, what do you, what do you see just moving forward in terms of um, you know, how your clients are like handling all this, you know, handling the situation right now. I know you like to travel too. <laughs> and well, but I didn't, I minimize my travel, which to Deborah's point, I think we're being much more ju- judicious about what our time is and where we bring a great value, right? I think everybody has, you know, as Clive said, we're going to come out of this better and really question it all. And I think we'll turn and be, it'll be a great impact of how we can do our time. But I think this comes to where more than ever, having the trust and rapport of your client is critical. So by the Zooms, the calls, the teams, all those things, I I feel like right now, because we have a high touch with clients always, it's been more impactful than it ever has. So they are more understanding part of the team and just want, you know, want what's best. We do have a lot of projects in construction right now, which is interesting. So I look at it and we have a huge project right now in New York that we're all having to come up to. And with Structure Tone and Gardner Theobald and a client, all the project managers and people, we could be really blamatory, but in fact, everybody's jumped on the ship to how do we make it better? How do we work as a team? There's no complaining. And if anything, wouldn't that be a great thing to take out of this, that everybody is really trying to get it done as one team. And I've really never seen everybody in the last few years with how busy we are, really approach it in that way. It's been like an unbelievable breath of fresh air. Yeah, Deborah, I, I, wanna, I wanna bring up because we recently um, published this incredible project, Millbank in Hudson Yards. And like, I'm always so proud that there's a lot of things that you, there are a lot of things that, that are gonna change, but there's so many things that you all as the design industry have, are, are doing, doing right. And that was an amazing example of getting um, it's getting terrace space in, in the build, right? So to tell everybody about that. This was pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, but in KPF, we're the building architects and they yeah. were really genius with related. So if you took X amount of square feet, you could get one or two terraces. And we really put all the amenity floors, Clodo, you would be proud. So off the cafe and off the reception, we have little gardens and they become such a breath of fresh air frankly, way more popular when they come back to work than when we design this space. But this integration of indoor, outdoor, I think is key. And I would love to see, yes, we're seeing a lot of more low rise buildings or high rise buildings with more outdoor space, but I think it's gonna become imperative to actually have a change or a transition to outdoor space as we go to these office buildings. And if anything, I think we've learned that. So wouldn't that be a great thing? But it really became the hallmark of their space. Yeah, like amazing. Like. Did you guys talk about that after, like, like we did, they approved the outdoor space? Well, it was the first thing we in our meeting. You know, the first meeting was I had to go to their executive committee and ask them to spend that money. And it's like, well, we've only met you once, but why? Because <laughs> two are better. That's what we said. Two are better. And it, it proved to be a really, really great hallmark for them. And their London office, which we're doing now, is kind of set at 100 Liverpool in a garden. So they, too, believe it's a really great time to have outdoor space. Amazing. Well, Deborah can get people to say yes. I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> um, but does anybody else have any like um, positive stories about um, outdoor space that they've worked on? Well, I think it was interesting to me that I, for, for residential clients who had nice roofs and were not interested in them, in, in them at all, suddenly were madly landscaping <laughs> for massive roof gardens yeah. you know, and multifamily buildings, massive, yeah. uh, massive green, biophilia rampant. <laughs> no, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's really- and you've been doing, And you've been doing a lot of residential development too. And yeah. always using outdoor space as we can. One of the things I'd love to see is that uh, in the lower cost housing, you know, that, that, uh, that uh, the amenities and the green spaces are taken into account. Uh, do you know the haves and the haves nots? 
Yeah, so it's something we're hoping that we'll be working on someday. <laughs> Yeah, I, first of all, I remember Claude, we went, so Claude and I went to, it was, was it Long Island City? The residential, yeah, design? yeah so Long Island City. And we, we toured all of the amenity spaces um, and there was a woman, so we were in a pool, we were in this pool area and there was this woman holding a baby, just a newborn. And she said, and it was a rental, you know, it was a rental building and the amenities are incredible. And she was practically in tears. And she said, I know yeah. here I am sitting, holding a newborn. I would never ever in my wildest dreams be able to afford anything like this. And it was a godsend. And then I introduced her to Cloda. It was like a moment, it was fantastic. Oh, it was, was a lovely moment. We were all a bit teary. You know, yeah, I, called, yeah. I called this upsizing. When you move from a house, and you go into a multifamily building, and in a case like this, you have 50,000 literally square feet of, of uh, space where you can play with a spa, basketball court, the whole thing. Right. Your apartment may be tiny, but if you're having a row with your spouse and you want to escape, there's lots of places you can go to without leaving the building. <laughs> there you go, Claude. There, there you go, Claude. Of course, you, you don't fight with anybody, so it's okay. <laughs> oh, I'm Irish. I'm Irish. I fight all the time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What else, get, what else gets you up in the morning? <laughs> I Clive, what, Clive, what about you? I was thinking about, I was thinking about the, the media, the design and media campus that you worked on in Santa Monica, and I was wondering yeah. how the school was doing. Um, <clears throat> well, I, ha I hate to say I'm not terribly up on it. Um, I think it's been, you know, it's always a the school itself has been shut down. I know KCOW, the radio station, um, has uh, also been struggling um, and has lost uh, some some of its key talent um, because uh, the, the revenue is not there. Um, <clears throat> you know, everyone you know everyone is suffering in, in different ways from uh, this this COVID uh, period, um, and I, I, you know I don't know. I think it's a new generation that's probably going to happen at that radio station. Maybe there's aspects of that that are really good. Um, again, you know, renewal and I think uh, revitalization um, is always a good thing. And is there some sort of pain along the way? Absolutely. But uh, yeah. that, that's life. Yeah, Deborah, Deborah. Yeah. I was just thinking about what everybody had been saying about renewed life on the street because of restaurants. And you certainly feel that in New York where everybody's eating outside and there's a real sort of joy to it and communality to it. You walk down the sidewalk, you they can tell you're smiling even behind your mask because uh, you're seeing people. But where I ache and a loss that I hope doesn't last and maybe we each have to do our parts is small local retail. and. Mm -hmm. Clive's description of the radio station, you know, we're seeing some changes and while we're all learning and there are many benefits, the thing I'm missing on the streets of New York is as you see the small stores closing, uh, I want the street life to not only be about eating outdoors, but about great windows to look into. Uh, so I, you know, shop local, support your local bookstore. Um, we're so used to ordering online. Let's remind ourselves that when you can walk around, walk around uh, so that our street life is about, it's great that it's about food and it should be more than about food. Yeah, so absolutely. That's my little right. plea. Yeah. What uh, Colin, go ahead. Yeah. So this seems like an incredible opportunity, right? So I think finally we're all realizing sort of the value of um, change in the community, right? And that hopefully we can get governments, you know, assisted creatives can really make change, right? Permanent change in terms of the design of the cities and the communities that we're in, you know. Um, I think we're all now sort of experiencing it. So we could we know real time. So hopefully our clients in the cities that we work with will really start to kind of pay attention and to value this change, right? Um, it also seems like an incredible opportunity to have long lasting social impact, right? You know, exactly like you're saying, Claude, you know, that this, this young woman could have this incredible amenity, you know, why aren't we designing space cities, you know, for everybody, right? You know, I think for so long, it's been sort of a white male world, right? And we're, we're, we're you know, obviously we've made some major, major strides, but, you know, we're still not completely there, right? So how do we really push forward with designing for everybody, you know, and literally, a big 10 everybody right not just those maybe with physical challenges or you know it could be learning it could be you know mental it could be you know religious i mean really designing everything <laughs> i think one okay. thing 
that's happening actually is that uh, there's more offsite building, you know, more prefab and where you can really iron out the kinks, you know, in, in, the, in the prefabrication uh, factory and then bring it in perfect and save a lot of money for people doing that. And then you have, and just uh, the money you save goes into the amenities. Mm -hmm. I mean, you. I mean, in some ways, you've had quite a bit of experience working in hospitality and residential development's given you a lot of um, really smart perspective, Cloda. Yeah, we're working on we're working on um, a job in Saudi where the all the bedrooms are going to be guest rooms are going to be prefabricated and brought in. Very interesting. So mm. it's, you know, it's a nice challenge, you know, where does that seam go? Where does that lock together, you know? Yeah. Very different to what we're used to. Yeah, that's as Clive is saying, like, yeah. uh, we're, we're exactly. kind of questioning everything and re-looking at everything. How do you were gonna say something? I, I, I was, thank you. There's, I think you brought up a really good point where, um, where, where what has also COVID sh shown a light on and you know, there's there's this um, equity that we we sometimes miss, where a lot of people staying at home, a lot of uh, companies allowing people to stay at home has allowed people to order in, and maybe you don't have to go down to the restaurant that's really struggling and the bookstores that are really struggling because you can just take advantage of the order up, but um, or the delivery. We're working on a, a low income housing project, a rather large one on Crenshaw and expo line it's the two it's the one existing metro line and the new line that's going to go to the la airport and it's a very very large um low-income housing but it also has mid-income housing for two points one that area not all the people get to order in or order amazon prime and they don't get their food delivered it, it and covid has really shown a light that this is a, an issue that has been um systemic for quite some time so this kind of food desert that has existed there has allowed us as architects to say, okay, now, wait a minute. Now, maybe this is where we bring in local commerce, local businesses, local food um, opportunities so that it does rejuvenate the street life because it, it is a different economic stratification that now can allow architects to think differently and not just go, oh, because of COVID, we're living a different life. It's a lot more comfortable, not here. and and. I'm grateful that that kind of um, re-looking at uh, the situations that, that we don't often get, uh, doesn't often get exposed is now creating a much greater, it's, a, it's a, a large courtyard that will span, urban courtyard that will span two parts of the street, but that is really the reaction and COVID has helped us seen, see that. And um, one last thing, the low income versus middle income one thing we're also seeing is that there's this, uh, the policemen, the nurses, this, this other e econ economic arena that um, does get disenfranchised. Here we're also able, the developers really stepped up and said, we're gonna have two parts to this, not just low income, but middle income. And we are gonna create a community out of it. It's a grand experiment and it is public private. It is with the city of Los Angeles. But I really don't think a lot of these um, conversations would have taken place at this much urgency and mm -hmm. heightened um, condition if we hadn't gone through the year that we did go through. So yeah. like Clive yeah. said, you know, it's difficult to go through these changes, but we do see there's optimistically really wonderful things that can come out of it. Yeah, I, I do want to bring up the developers, um, if you guys can uh, think, think about um, any examples. But Hagi, I... I was thinking about your, you've been working with sort of a, a young progressive developer in Mexico City for quite a few years now. And, and if, if I'm right, I mean, you tell, if, if I'm right, it was, it was also, I don't know if it was any low income, but it was about bringing the community into the buildings as well, right? That's absolutely correct. And there, there, they really didn't look at the social strata, the economic stratification. It was endemic of the culture. So it's all about how everything mixes, not just how the people mix, but the indoor, the outdoor, um, the, the street lifestyle, bringing it up to a rooftop so that there's a cohesiveness between the top and bottom. How do you do that? How does some you know, uh, American come in and understand that intuitively? 
their interest in creating this kind of mix of cultures, mix of technology to heighten what uh, they see best of, of the community is really what's so exciting. That hasn't stopped, even though I, mm. uh, as we are going through difficult times with COVID, they are as well, very, very tough times. Their boldness, the, the courageousness, they're, they're still going, they're still building, they're still going for it. It's extraordinary to me. I'm, I'm really, really humbled by all of it. So don't you think, don't you all think that this is, um, Deborah, I'll, I'll get to you. Don't you think this is the time that in, in a way, like you, you need clients for, you know, obviously for work and for your jobs, but they really, they really need you, you know, for your, you know, for your brilliant thinking and your minds and don't you think this is the time we're going to remember all those clients that we that we stayed close to or new clients? Like this will be the thing that you will always cement in your memory of a kind of deeper relationship with these clients. Deborah, you were going to say something. That well, was well said. I was going to be well said on what uh, Haggy and Colin were saying and use the term infrastructure and try to weave something else in, particularly because we've just had elections and people talk about, politicians talk about infrastructure and they mean, you know, airports and mass transit and rail lines and roads and electricity and water power and maybe Wi-Fi access for all. But on top of that, what everybody's been talking about is something where developers could certainly play a role and where we have all played a role, which is what I would call social infrastructure, which is public spaces, rooftops, desirable streetscapes, rethinking zoning so that the public space is a place where everybody can be and where they want to be, access to green vegetables and community gardens, like all of that, that is also infrastructure. And maybe as some of my colleagues here are doing, we can help bring our developer colleagues, clients along to understand the kind of contributions they can make to social infrastructure, not just built infrastructure. I completely agree. Deborah, you were going to say something? Well, I and I think even beyond the developers, because they clearly are driving this, I think we, and it's the relationship with our clients, the clients now are pushing it. General Dynamics has you know, an outdoor garden for all the local school children that they're bringing in and teaching different classes. Google and um, LA is looking at bringing their people out and there's like a bread and bakery shop teaching people how to cook and that's how they're touching the community. So now it's the challenge of architects, designers and our clients to reach how we used to 20 years ago, but we kind of got lost with it, I think. And now everybody's trying to make a difference. So as everybody's already said before me, is this is a really wonderful time to be able to be entrepreneurial, strategic, and just smart with our clients to do things we never could do. So how do you challenge them? So I think it's a great time with that because they want to do something. Right, and this is a time your clients are gonna to listen to things that maybe they wouldn't have listened to in the past, right? Correct. <laughs> right? So I, what, what are they going to listen It's easier. To? It's easier for them to get on board because they want to do it. They want to do it for their people. I mean, it's right. that you, you know, we talk about all the office spaces and we really come down to what's the culture of each client and that will determine how they use office buildings. But all this comes into what is their culture? What are their beliefs? And it's become more critical than ever that there are different identifiers with each client. Like who are they and why are they doing something and how they can, can they be leaders because they aren't having as much social interaction. So it's more important than ever to put a marker out and to lead in a unique way that's good for them. That really is who they are as a company. Yeah, I mean, Clive, you, you're always, I mean, I feel like Deborah was just talking about you and you're always fighting for design and creating new cultures for for companies, I think you said there were a couple of breakthroughs like recently for some um, some of your clients or some new clients. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, following on from uh, uh, what Deborah was saying. Um, Wait, does everyone have a hard time hearing Clive or is it just me? Oh, am I not talking Talk a loud? little louder. Talk a okay, little louder. Sorry, I'll, I'll uh, talk up. Um, okay. <clears throat> now, I think that this, the COVID, uh, the most interesting thing about COVID is it's disrupted the uncertainties uh, 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 with our clients. Um, 
we're so familiar with clients who've come to the table with pretty set ideas about what they want and need. Um, and they regard often uh, it, it is a battle to, to promote and, and uh, um, <clears throat> develop design thinking because they're skeptical and they've got this idea that uh, this is what we need, make it look pretty. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, your role is, is you know, just, just that. Uh, right. And we've got a whole lot of other people playing roles and you're just, you know, one piece of, of the puzzle. Uh, don't don't get uh, uh, don't get too disruptive. Mm -hmm. And now um, the clients uh, have been disrupted by COVID. Uh, it's not us, and uh, they they are uncertain. Their certainties have turned into uncertainties. So I think this is a, a massive opportunity for conversations yes, that so. can really uh, reframe what we're doing, reframe the industry, reframe uh, our clients' goals. Uh, you know, as we are saying, con contributing to social infrastructure. Uh, mm -hmm. What does that mean? How can they be, be, become part of something that is so important uh, to the life of cities? I, you know, they want to be part of something that's so important to the life of cities. So we, can, you know, it, it's in everyone's interest to to have these conversations uh, go down all the roads that they need to go down. It's kind of yeah. amazing to me. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead, oh, sorry. go ahead, Colin. Go ahead. But I was just going to say that's good. It's amazing to me how much um, with our consulting group, how much workplace of the future we're doing. I mean, it's completely up in people's minds. I mean, all this thing, all these sort of ideas, you know, and from a strategy perspective that we've been talking about and trying our clients to embrace. You know, like years ago, the Macquarie Project, right? That you did, Clive. That sort of set the the standard and you know, sort of charted a course for new ways of working in a huge way. You know, I think all of that is finally coming to be, right? And they're asking us even to push beyond that, right? So it's opened up this amazing time of opportunity, right? And someone reminded me today that the cholera epidemic actually created the sewer system, right? It was invented after that, right? Modern architects with big open windows and things like that came after tuberculosis, right? So, you know, there will be this incredible time for innovation and change, right? That comes out of this because I think we all, all of us now are thinking different, right? Our drivers, what we value is different, right? So what, what an amazing opportunity for, for all of us to move forward. No, I think, and, and don't you think, and don't you think too, Colin, I mean, you know, obviously Gensler, I, you know, thousands of people all over the world working, like, that, you know, if we get to the other side of this, there's gonna be a lot of work because <laughs> if there's we're gonna changing everything, work. we're gonna yeah. need all of you to change it, right? Right. I mean, the roaring twenties came after the epidemic in 1918, you know, 20, right? So we will probably hopefully be going back into the roaring 20s again, right? Um, right. You know, I think right. we're also cooped up, you know, like we're probably gonna have a little PTSD, when, you know, on the other side of this, so we can actually be somewhat normal. But, you know, once we get through that, oh my gosh, I think it's gonna be, you know, everyone's gonna be enjoying themselves and, you know, embracing life and getting back out there and, and doing things, right? So, which I think will make us all yeah, very busy. For sure. Yeah. All right, we have, but, wait, but we have if, to wait, there's a oh. chat. There's something from the chat. Oh. There's something from the chat and we'll get to you, I promise. From Stanley, Stanley Felderman. Hi, Stanley. He said, um, and, and we're obviously, at, those of us who are New Yorkers are definitely interested in what's going on in our cities for sure. And he's also asking, um, can you address non-urban design, including the role that suburban America will play in the future? Good question, Stanley. I think it's interesting, a lot of my friends who, um, are designers who are like have a place like let's say in the Catskills that was always the refuge and now they're getting work out there and they're getting doing a little resort and they're you know like which was never 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 the case in the past what do you guys see Deborah what do you what do you see about our city our beloved New York City Deborah Burke <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I assume you mean that since I'm yeah. sitting just a block or two from Gracie Mansion. So I really, um, uh, I, the question about the suburb I think is a really interesting one because when designers get together, we often most rapidly talk about talk about cities. I, right. But the suburb is now a place of focus both for politicians and, and for families and for a certain lifestyle. 
One, I think we need to be looking at alternative means of transportation within suburbs. So it's not just about the car. And in right. fact, when we reduce the number of cars that people need or they find more creative ways to use them, we can begin to repurpose garages, let's say, so that right. we're not looking at rooms in buildings having only one purpose, but rooms in buildings having more than one purpose, which is definitely another thing that we learned from COVID, right? How does your dining table work as your office? And then do you, how do you change it enough that you can have a nice meal with your spouse uh, at the end of the day and not feel like you're sitting in your office. So we could do that for the suburb too, right? We could do that for the garage, we could do that for transportation. And we could think back to the early suburbs, which were mostly about railroad stops, that they themselves had little tiny centers. And the idea that there is a center around something, whether it's the library, the school, the church, the whatever it might be, where people would gather. And this too might begin to break down dependence on Amazon and delivery services. Maybe you walk to your little grocery store that's in the neighborhood or where the bus stop is or near where you drop your kids off to school. So I, in all the optimism that we've all been talking about, I would say I have great optimism for the suburb and the revitalization of the suburb as people see in it the opportunities to be outdoors but don't want to give up what they've learned to enjoy in the city. So that's that's my little pep talk. All of my colleagues can chime in now, but that's my pep talk for take advantage of the pop. Yeah, well, do, I mean, you know, the interesting thing is like, you know, I've been, you know, sequestered here for, well, I don't know, as long as we all have and haven't moved around a lot and just been doing shows on TV. And, you know, like, I, I kind of can't wait to get back to the city. I know everywhere all say like, oh, this is so great. But by the time we're free again, don't you think we're really <laughs> in some ways, look, it's going to be a new, it's going to be something different. But I want to go to back to the city <laughs> and I'm in a nice place. I can't complain. So. But you want to go back to the city to do what we all want to do. I think, what do we miss? Theater. What, like the things that we still can't do, we figured out how to eat outside. Hopefully we figured out shopping and stuff like that. And right. I think to Hagi's point, uh, we, a bright light has been shown on urban inequity and suburban inequity, and we are, should be forced to address that. But the joy moments, like in a crowded museum or uh, at a Broadway show, that's what we're gonna come running back for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We're starting to see a lot of young people move out, right? Just for afford, yeah. from an affordability standpoint. I mean, the fact that they can now work from home and they don't have to commute in, right? They're starting to, to, to choose, other, choose other options, which I think is really interesting. There's been a lot of discussion in the UK about the revitalization of the secondary cities, right? And how this might be an incredible opportunity for them to take advantage of this situation. You know, not that it's gonna be the, you know, the end of London for, for you know, but, um, you know, we'll see a rise in Birmingham and Manchester and other places where people have other choices in terms of where they live and in firms being more open to them living in other places, right? If they don't have to be in the hub in, in London. That's so I always, Deborah. But it, but it seems on the other, there just was this interesting article about how many people are coming into New York and renting apartments or buying things. So despite the fact that there's a lot of people moving out, there are some high records of pre-purchase in New York right now. So I think there's those moving out and those that potentially get an opportunity to move into cities like New York or London that are so expensive. So again, it's just this switch, which is interesting. I mean, right now I'm sitting in Washington, D.C., and I have to say that living in a wonderful green city that we can walk to work and have our own building has become really unique, but we still go to New York once a week. So I, I think it's that new balance that we know and everybody's getting to question what works for them and they're having opportunities to make those transitions that they didn't maybe have before. Yeah, I do want to talk about, uh, I do want to talk about hospitality. You know, I've always said that hospitality has been the golden child of our industry. Like, Everybody who does work has always wanted to get into hospitality and boy has it, we know has taken such a blow. Um, although we are all already here that on the other side, hospitality is gonna boom like we've never seen before. Cloda, I know that you, um, you know, you and you and Deborah both do um, quite a fair bit of hospitality. Uh, I, I remember reading something about like the six senses, the one in Portugal, the one that you designed was the most successful, most popular, most money-making place. How, how, are, how are the six senses doing? 
and how are your hospitality projects in general? Well, they're, they're all over the place. Success is in Portugal is doing very well. They've reopened, they're doing very well. I just heard from them. We're doing a hotel in Cayman Islands, which has just stopped. We're waiting for it to start again. We're doing a hotel in, in Argentina and it's a wellness hotel, which is very interesting in Bariloche. And that's plowing on. <laughs> But all of them, it, it, all of them, the, 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 and of course the Miravals, which we do, the, the, the focus is on wellness and the focus is on simplicity, everything that you need, nothing more than what you need. And um, I think the hotel developers will be, who are working now and plowing on are going to be very successful when this lifts. I mean, we have a vaccine apparently, right? <laughs> it's, um, but it's, it's, uh, the hotels are more demanding uh, about um, <clears throat> un understanding of wellness and joy and art in the corridors, all those things which we used to have to fight for. Just yeah, saying, yeah, 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 let people enjoy the walk to their room. And we're like army tanks, we charge, you know, we just keep going, you know, <laughs> unless they say to stop. <laughs> but the stop, I think what COVID's done is changed people's perception about life and living. That yeah. life is actually something to enjoy, you yeah. know? Yeah. And yeah. It's, not, it's not always the goal. It's, this yeah. is a very goal driven society we're in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe, but, maybe, maybe, I, no, I totally, I totally agree. I think this, issue of uh, a future of possible hybrid working uh, mm -hmm. or blended working, whatever the word might be for it, uh, where someone comes into the office for two or three days a week and not five exactly. days a week. Exactly. Probably <laughs> by far the biggest change factor in, in everything that's going to happen in the future. And it's prob probably one of the reasons why hotels themselves are going to do so well in the future, because people are going to go leave town for four or five days. Uh, not just for, you know, two day weekend, uh, mm -hmm. and they're going to work while they're away, mm -hmm. um, but they're going to be somewhere that they want to be. And I think uh, mobility with people is going to be so much uh, increased that uh, this, the landscape is going to change. Uh, you know, a lot of people are going to choose to live uh, two hours out of town uh, five days a week because they only go in for two days. Um, and this is the whole workforce we're talking about. It's everyone. Me, uh, and inclu me included. That's exactly what I'm doing. But in, but in fact, we, that's... We yeah, work, but in maybe, fact, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say that we, we work, that we work uh, stuff may also turn into we work, we play. Right, mm -hmm. right. Hagi, what were we going to say? Yes. I was going to say, uh, just adding to Clive, but in fact, mobility is decreased and flexibility is increased because if you're not going in every day, you're, you're less mobile by choice. And then we're also speaking about the other silver lining, and that is the environment. There are so many things that have, because we have retra we retracted so much, we've also seen going out, doing things as a necessity allows us to also be mindful of, you know, the other great um, epidemic that we are still engaged in, which is the environment. And to Clive's point, we don't have to go to work every day, so we're not commuting every day. We, we are seeing that kind of opportunity, how you, like, like Deborah said about the, the, you know, the dining room table and the garage, flexibility again. So we're, we're really building upon COVID in, a, in hopes and efforts that it also takes advantage of how do we become more sustainable, less needs to you know, drive and fly and go. I, I think that's um, like Colin said, you know, there was a, after every, after every um, pandemic, there was a, uh, a solving of something. Unfortunately, th that is so encouraging when you said that, but on this one, the exit isn't necessarily the, you know, we may be exiting out of one thing, but we are still engaged in another bigger um, issue. But the issues we learned from COVID seem to me that will help us really try to fight or support design through uh, means of sustainability. I mean, can we, can we just say that, like, even, you know, Hagi, what, what, every, what you're saying, what everyone's agreeing to, that, like, what, what work life will look, look like and how many days you might go to work, is that, like, we're all, we're saying it all the time. Is that, not, 
like mind blowing if you mm -hmm. think about all of our careers were one way. Right. And and like you said, Clive, like it takes pain and suffering. And now we're just like, oh yeah, that's what it's going to be. Like it's so like mind boggling in it's a way, right? Yeah. So we just we just got the results of our workplace performance index back, um, both for the U.S. and U.K. And it was fascinating, right? Because. 20% of people don't want to go back at all, right? And over 50% are asking for a hybrid model, right? Where they ideally would work from home, you know, two to three days, days a week and then, you know, three days in the office. So, you know, I think the smart employers, right? I don't they have, think they probably have any choice, right? It'll be really, really interesting to see what comes on the other side of this, but that's what people are asking for. You know, we've lived this now for nine months and been able to have a baby, as Cloda said, right? <laughs> and that baby is hopefully choice and, and freedom to work where and how we want to work moving forward, right? In, yeah. in there is, like there is, though, I think, a, a hidden problem and with the, we've, we're, we've been we're trying to talk about, and that is, you know, uh, divorce went up 55% in Wuhan after oh. the lockdown. And uh, I think the interaction between, between the family and the dynamics and where you work and where you don't work and how you signal if you're working or not uh, you know, can, can you make that call upstairs, please? You know, <laughs> and it's the interiors are, 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 are creating a different kind of a challenge. So people, each person has their own private space, but you can't lock them into it in a small house, you know, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's not easy. Yeah, and, uh, it, I think talk, one of our, pro talk. our problems is trying to solve that. Yeah. Edward de Bono, I think I said this to you, Cindy, before, in a, in a house which is like our house, which is a small and very open house that we're in at the moment, is to wear a hat if you if don't want to be interrupted. I got my thinking hat on, you know, <laughs> but how, how you create red light signals and stuff like that between people, because there is a lot of polemic in households. Talk to my friends and I have to say there's a lot of problems. Anybody agree with that? I think I, I completely, <laughs> I completely agree. And let's talk about like emotional well-being. I know yes. that my, my husband and I were like driving around the town just to take a drive. And my husband was like very concerned that I don't get sick. You know, he's like extremely, he's like the loviest person ever. And he's like, he's like, what, like there's just too many people out. And I said, well, you know, you have to remember also that not everyone has our relationship. And if you think about being stuck with somebody that you actually might not like so much, or have a bad relationship with it would it you'd almost rather get sick you know I, and I don't mean it completely. I mean that relationships and like your happiness and emotional well-being are we don't talk about it enough Deborah, I think you're going to say something oh you're I think you're muted I think you're muted I think Yep, okay. I'm unmuted. Okay. No, I just was saying my daughter lives, Margaret, she's 25, lives in San Francisco with three girls in a, you know, three bedroom apartment that, and I think they share a bathroom. So, you know, that's been really hard. They've actually all moved home. You know, so there's that <laughs> issue of who comes back. So now we have them all at home. Now a new problem has arisen. <laughs> now they're all home. There's a new problem. Like, and she's in my office too. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> so I got out of my home office, but I do think it's a huge issue of um, choice and heads down, where can we be most effective, right? So I think as we come out of this, where are we most efficient? In many days, it might be at home and we have proven mm -hmm. all across the board that we can be really, really valuable, add value, be efficient in our home office. But there is an issue that we have lost social in interaction. You know, we have kind of like a, a family of friends at the office, you have your, you know, an extension. So all of those social issues are much harder when we're just doing Zoom and Teams and we're all at home. So I think it's gonna, that will be the magic, the special sauce as we call it for each company of how do you give everybody that flexibility? How do people have their own healthy way of working and living? Um, and, and now we know that we've proven it all, but I think that'll be the big issue as we come back. We know we can do it, it's what's the mix. And I think it's gonna be different. And when we come back to the office, it has to be really worth coming back to. You know, it has to be like high touch, high flex, chance meetings. There has to be a reason why you go there because you now know the other option. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And Clive, I know that it's so Clive just built this beautiful house and he has a new, newish, amazing wife. 
but there's their kids, your kids, her kids. Um, and I know that, I know that we were talking about your house. You were saying like, you were talking about the kids, like lovingly, but like, they go crazy. You know, you were saying they're there. They, you put, I put them there. So how are you, how are you handling the whole education at home? Like, how is that working? They're on, they're on, uh, there's three of them downstairs on, on the school right now. Um, uh -huh. Honestly, we're, we're, we're lucky because we have, I know you are. And, and space is everything, as, as Clara was saying. Uh, I think when people are really on top of each other, things got, can start getting very painful. Um, so I, I, can't, I can't complain at all. It, it's working really well. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's uh, yeah, we're blessed. I know, well, you have like an amazing life, so forget you. <laughs> well, I have amazing life actually in part because of space and because I can't hear the screams. <laughs> there, you there you go. Now, De 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 Deborah, let's let's talk a little bit more about education. I mean, that that seems to be that does seem, and maybe in like the younger, like like maybe not so much in higher ed, but you know, not being able to pivot in the same way. And there's so many issues with um, you know the younger kids and how they're learning. And like, what are some of the things you're talking about at at Yale? Uh, well, to the younger kids and how they're learning into Clive's situation, I think we, you know, all of us should give a shout out to to the teachers and to, and to the parents because working at big home with little children, big love, is big love, big a love. very hard thing to do. So big, big shout out. At the university level, one of the big issues that we're dealing with, quite frankly, is the mental health of students because you go to college and you go to graduate school to be part of a new community where you can create your own identity away from your parents and your family and where you're from. And how you make that possible when you're mostly sitting in an apartment by yourself, let's say you move to New Haven from Pakistan or China or South America somewhere, and you're all by yourself and English isn't your first language and you're quarantined for two weeks and then you can only go to studio on limited hours. My biggest concern as an educator is making sure that my students and students all across at every college and university in, in the world really know that they are part of a community and how do we show them that they're part of a community. It's a little bit not unlike the big office model. How are people more how are they on a team more than just being on a Zoom screen like we, like the nine of us are, right? Okay. You know, that, um, how do we make them feel welcome? And I think when schools reopen for real, what we will, we will appreciate the work that students can do at home, but we will celebrate more the things that feel good together as a community. Yeah, I always, I always say that now. Like, I, I don't know how you guys all feel, but feel like the generate. There's somehow the generations are like balancing each other out because um, the older generation has had to become more tech savvy, just, you know, just, <laughs> just to get on the Zoom and get off and on. And then the young generation that we're worried about, frankly, because they're alone, tend to be in smaller apartments, and and they they're they're needing the connection, they're needing the mentorship of you know of the studios. Are you finding that as well? Yeah, I, and I will say I have a daughter in graduate school and she she stayed in the city where her school is, even though being at home would be easier and more comfortable, just so she could meet a classmate for a cup of coffee outside, you know, with a mask on six feet apart because of uh, that's, that sense of community. And for everybody talking about whether, you know, 10% of their employees never want to come back or some people can't wait to come back, I really do think it's about those moments of togetherness that studio brings where you can yeah. be both solitary in your work, but in a larger community at the same time. Yeah. It's what's so great about the design environment that we want to make sure we hang on to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are, are you thinking, are you guys finding, uh, or is anything you can share just in terms of like technology and how you guys are solving new problems? Um, oh, Hagi, I just want to add something that maybe, and maybe I'll lead into technology, but yeah. maybe there is a, a, a hope here that, you know, we are all transitional in terms of we've, we've experienced one way of life, one culture, one way to approach design. And then we're going through uh, COVID, but the, the students and the kids 
it's as if um, one learns a language later in life versus one growing up with a language. They will be far more facile with the technology of communication remotely. The nuances of how you maybe speak or misspeak, what you wear, what you don't wear, all the little things that we relied on when we saw people or when we engaged with people. If this is somewhere, if this is a, a realm in which they're growing up in, whether they're graduate students or, ch or children in school, um, though there, of course, there's the mental illness issue, but there also is the resiliency issue that the adaption, how they adapt to this, they will be the experts. They will, they will teach or be able to design within a realm that perhaps, you know, we're fixing, but they're engaging and blossoming and growing. So the optimism of who the, whom they will be and what they will bring to the design profession as to how we engage is really exciting. Yeah, right? That could be extraordinary because I see how they interact on our meetings and they're beating, you know, they're running circles around us, me. <laughs> so, and I think that's a great thing, especially in education, especially with technology. Don't you think it's important too that like we, you know, as those that maybe are a little bit different point in our careers, right? That we pass down our knowledge, right? Um, we have a responsibility to share, right? And to inspire them, right? And to teach them and mentor them, you know, because I think in their hands, you know, our future is really bright, right? I mean, if we're, if we're thinking about what the future of design is, it's really in the, the minds and the imaginations of the students and the young people, right? That, that we all are very fortunate to work with every single day, right? Um, but at the same time, we probably need to play our part in, in sort of teaching them what we know, right? Because there's still a lot of relevance in everything that we've learned over, you know, these, these amazing careers we've been fortunate to have. Yeah, right. I mean, don't you Definitely. guys find the mentorship is a really hard thing? I, I, I find that even just, even just like organizing the stuff we've been organizing for the next two weeks, it's like a bad game of telephone tag, like, who was on the Zoom, who knows what, who doesn't know, who you have to like say it again. You've learned not to like kind of lose your cool because you read the note and you think it makes sense but somebody else, like it's kind of crazy. You know, I think, I think uh, and the way I look at it, I'm being mentored up by the young people in the studio and I'm homeschooling in IT at the moment, you know. <laughs> Both ways. Both ways, yeah. exactly. Both ways. It's true. Deborah, you were going to say something. Well, and we actually have new hires this year that started in September. And we have our senior team that pretty much comes in. We have, we're allowed to have 15 people in the office. And the issue that we did, which has paid off so well, is we've had our new hires come in once a week with the senior team. And I think of two or three years ago when we we're all on airplanes, all in different cities, that our new architects are actually spending time you know, to your issue kind of, you know, like how do we teach them? How do they learn what design is? How can they dream? How they, you know, can take a space and make it something magical. And so that's been really a, a gift for me because I never get to spend time with our first year architects. And so to have had that and to spend time in the studio with these young, brilliant people has, as Clodagh said, they are making me better. And hopefully I'm making them a little bit better, you know, but, but it's a, a rework of not doing the norm anymore. How did we just shake it up? Right. And, and do you guys think to that point that we keep talking about, well, in the past, we always talked about like designing your clients for the future, right? Now we kind of don't know what the future is and it keeps changing and shifting and we're doing a lot of improvising. Um, how do you, as, as, as designers who your responsibility is to like look at a future that right now is unknown, um, how are you dealing with that responsibly for your clients? Is it more being flexible and adaptable and changeable? We're, no pressure. We're talking, yeah, no pressure. <laughs> I mean, no, we're talking a fair amount with them about us giving them an operating system. So when they move in day one, right, it's not finished, right? That it's really something that's going to evolve and change over time. Um, knowing that we don't, don't know what the future holds in a lot of ways, right? So it's nothing as best we can. It's based it as a static, right? And it also, I think, helps them think differently. So I think a lot of us, 
And our client said, okay, we move in day one, it's completely finished. It's gonna be like that for the next five, 10 years. But the reality is, especially in, in the times that we've just gone through, right? Like change is constant. So giving them, you know, a system that, that can grow and adapt and, and flex with them is really, is really critical. Yeah. So it's creating the manual basically. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, Haji said something really interesting. Uh, one thing that isn't changing that we need to change is the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And to, as we return to what we remember as normal, being able to gather, go to work, use transportation, get on an airplane, invite people over for dinner, you know, all that stuff. We should remember that we have this big picture responsibility as designers of the built environment to never forget that we must in everything we do continue to address the climate crisis because it's not going away and that is right. not an unknown that's a huge right. known uh yeah. that is our responsibility to be part of the team that solves it um yeah. so i don't want us to lose sight of that in the immediacy of covid we have a vaccine when we figure out how to distribute it, COVID will diminish the way other pandemics have. But this thing, this is big. And it is the biggest thing any of us, the young people we're talking about and us will face in our lifetimes. And we need to take it on. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, as, and as you said, like there's a lot of things that are healing in a way because we're all kind of sequestered mm -hmm. and it is, it, it, it is like an instinct. I know that every, you know, like everything's good. We're all going to change and be this, but then once you start getting your jobs and have to go all over the place, like what happens, right? So anyway, thank you, Deborah. So true. But Deborah, I think, and, and everybody, I think the, wor the world is a very big picture. You know, climate change is huge. So the world is a very big picture made of little brush strokes. So we try to train our clients to do a bit. If everybody does a bit with philanthropy, with with being aware of climate change, you know, just just raising their consciousness. It's like women's live. We're raising their consciousness to the, to the climate <laughs> every day. Every right. day. Right. <laughs> right. And, and to that, so maybe one last question. Um, we, we talk about what we want to do um, to help our society, and are there are there certainly certainly Deborah? You raised the flag by being the first women dean at Yale. Like amazing, amazing. And there are so many social issues that we're trying to heal and do better, right? So, but what are some of the positives that maybe you, as your firm, um, or personally, um, are doing? I I know you've got a really nice project going on in Italy that maybe you want to share. Yeah, you turn your mic on. <laughs> that actually is my hardest project right now. Yes. Because oh, Deborah wants to start a foundation. I, well, we have a foundation. And it really is for architects and designers to be more collaborative. And how do we promote design excellence across the boards, whether it's in city planning, urban issues, sustainability, art? And how do we just get people who never dreamed they could go somewhere and be with creatives, a chance to change our cities or our environments. And for our firms, we have two foundations. Our firm, however, has taken an opportunity team with uh, sixth, seventh and eighth graders here in Washington with the mayor and a group called Higher Achievement. And we're starting what we're calling an opportunity fund to teach architecture and culture to these young children. So that sixth, seventh and eighth grade is a big decisive point for all of them. And how do we make a difference in our city? So those two things are reaching out all based on architecture and design. And my daughter had told me that when she was in Chicago, that if you asked most uh, fourth and fifth graders what they wanted to be when they were older, they wanted to be architects mm -hmm. and very few did. And so I think for us, all of us, our mission really is Deborah's taking it on at the highest level. I think we need to take it on at a lower level so that everybody in our offices and in our schools looks a little different than it does today. And that probably is one of our biggest issues here in Washington of what we're trying to change. And, 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 and by the way, I just want to tell you a big shout out to DC because, because there were more projects 
for best of year this year in DC, I, we were shocked. Like we were shocked. There were so many projects from firms. So big shout out to you, Deborah. And to these well, it's as Clodagh said, like stroke by stroke, you know, not stroke, overnight, stroke but stroke. over time. <laughs> so, so Clodagh's got her uh, thorn tree project, which has been, you've been passionate about it for years and years and years. 19 years now. Yeah. It's 19 years now. And we wow. I mean, started off with 113 kids, and now we have over 1,500. We've got graduates. We've got an environmentalist, pastoral nomads, with an environmentalist who went back to the tribe. You know, so it's uh, it's uh, it, it, it's fifteen hundred little brush strokes, <laughs> but it's I mean, working. Laura, it's I'm working. Beautiful, beautiful. Clive, you have anything going on with your uh, kids in the office? Are they coming up with any plans for the community? <clears throat> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> everyone's, we're all struggling to survive. There. I know, I, I don't, there's no pressure. I don't mean to give you pressure, but I, I do wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you actually, just are some of the kids going, coming back to the office? Yes, we have, a, a, but very few. Um, I think the most interesting thing about this sort of, this new, uh, I mean, I was calling it a, a mobility and Huggy was rightly calling it uh, a potential immobility uh, that we shouldn't be commuting all the time. Uh, one of our uh, staff members, a couple of them kind of went to uh, other states and things like that for little periods of time. One of them went back to her home in Costa Rica for a couple of weeks and ended up staying for four months with absolutely no impact on her work. <clears throat> she worked from Costa Rica for four months. Mm -hmm. And I, this is what really drove home to me how the future can be so completely different. The right. idea that you can, yeah, totally. say, well, I can do exactly the same job and I can be uh, sitting on a beach in Thailand. Um, I can be anywhere. And, and the, the enormity of that sort of, you know, comes home to you. This that's, will be such a different future. That's, the, that's the thing, exciting. right? Who knew? And even for us as well, too, like everybody here, right? Like, didn't you always think that, okay, I can be traveling and away from the office or teaching but when I'm not, I'm in the office, right? Now it's like, just opens up. All right, we have six more minutes, but I want to get to six minutes because then we, we're getting like cut off. So Hagi, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, you mean, what am I doing in the office? Well, I want to, I want to, uh, add on to really quickly we're we're incorporating a, a jedi where uh justice equality the, the 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 kids in the office really um brought forth an, an opportunity to create more of an egalitarian um discussion group where everybody really starts to uh face the systemic uh racism and what we can do and we didn't do it the management didn't do it everybody else did it and I have to say, it, it's been extraordinary because um, we are now trying to uh, not we're you know we're relooking we're revisiting our hiring practice we're revisiting who, how we um, collectively work on uh, projects with consultants who they are what other things they might do that may be in conflict you know philosophically and ideologically we are reintroducing. Um, everything we can into the office. This was the opportunity during, during uh, Black Lives Matter and COVID and, and where the world is going, this, this election. This was one incredibly difficult, yet I'm seeing such inspirational moves with organically growing in the office, hands off, let it happen, you know, come at it. That's the best part about this year for, for me. Yeah. And I'm just, just grateful to everybody. Can we just give everybody. a hallelujah to like oh, yeah. what's happening right now? Yeah. Happening. Hallelujah. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. And I'm so glad, you know, you're the, the kids in your studio are amazing. And um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have think, thought anything, but the best ideas anyway. So Colin, what, what about you? So maybe building on that a little bit on what Huggy was saying, you know, I think for us as an industry, right, to truly design for diversity and inclusion, we need to, we need to look like, you know, the, the external community at large, right? So we're actually, we have a major push on diversity and inclusion, you know, we're really trying to put our money where our mouth is, so to speak, you know, we have a five, five point plan against racism, which is really wonderful, you know, sort of using and leveraging our relationships to really create 
positive change. You know, we're, we're, you know, on our own part, you know, completely committed to increasing racial diversity in our staff. You know, we're, we're creating opportunities for, for minorities, partnering with schools, partnering with anybody that, that we can, you know, make positive, positive change. Um, we're also, you know, really about equitable solutions in our cities and communities, creating opportunities for, especially in A&D, for the, for the minorities are out there, but then also, you know, partnering with our clients, right, to seeing what we can yeah. do collectively. So, you know, again, and, and a lot of this is being driven by, you know, really people, you know, of all ages in the firm, but definitely a lot of the young people who are yeah. incredibly passionate about this, right, and they live it every day, and they're teaching us all, you know, a they lot are. about, you know, how to, how to, That's beautiful. You know, to yeah. be more tolerant and open, yeah. Okay, Deborah. last few minutes. E Deborah. Yes, um, Deborah. Well, I want to. I mean, what what Deborah was was saying and what uh, Colin was saying, they mesh together because we need to let the youngest kids know from whatever, no matter what their background is, that there are opportunities for real careers in built environment professions, from engineering to landscape architecture, from interiors to regional planning. That whole thing. There's jobs in there for everybody and they can serve their communities in that way, just the way a doctor can or a lawyer can. So I'm all for the largest and we're doing it in my office and we're definitely doing it, Yale, the most inclusionary approach to uh, design environment professions for everybody and we will all be better for it. Absolutely. I, you know, the one thing I, one thing I always say just in terms of like putting together a magazine is that design loves all colors of the rainbow. And we just have to prove it throughout all the different channels and avenues to get someone to be a designer and architect too. So thank you. Thank you all for supporting that. By the way, Friday, we're doing a conversation called Design Unity with Cheryl Durst and IIDA. And um, thank you guys so much. You guys made me so, so thank you. I'm oh, sending big love to everybody. Uh, to thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. Nice to see you all. Too. Promise, Cindy, Cindy. Cloda, Colin, Clive. Um, I love you. I love you guys. You were the first of our big two week <laughs> uh, Best of Design celebration. We're going to kick it off with the film festival in one minute. But um, virtual hugs to everybody. Thank you for everything you do. I am like so touched and just so honored to be in your presence and to have this many of you at the same time. Wowza. Um, but keep it up. We'll get to the other side because of your leadership and goodness. And uh, as I always say, go forth and design. So love you guys. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. of eight different brands with you, the answer is always yes, we can. Welcome everybody to our Hall of Fame Film Festival. Now, for those of you just tuning in, Interior Design's Hall of Fame honors architects and designers and industry luminaires whose talent, vision, 
and dedication contribute to the highest standard of excellence in all areas of design. I like to say, it's our Oscars. Now, over my career as Editor-in-Chief, I have been lucky enough to spend time with these awe-inspiring talents and film these mini documentaries that we then feature at our big, glorious gala event in New York, actually this very week. Well, since we can't be together, we thought the next best thing would be to share them all with you. Plus, stay tuned because after most, I have a one-on-one -on -one chat to catch up and talk about what they're up to now and their vision for the future. And by the way, for this year only, we put a pause on inducting new members into the Hall of Fame so that we can properly honor those who have earned this distinction in the future in a room filled to the brim with their colleagues and loved ones with a stage for them to share their stories. Now, watch out for next year when we are back together again. It's gonna be unbelievable. Oh yeah. But before we get started, I wanna give a sincere thank you to all of our 2020 Hall of Fame sponsors. Thank you, Benjamin Moore. Thank you, Material Bank. And thank you, Turf, for this wonderful, glorious, celebratory backdrop. Okay, everybody, so today is day one and we kick off the film festival with the following Hall of Famers. We start with our Brazilian modernist, Isai Weinfeld. He was inducted in 2016. And then the unconventional and irrepressible Paula Mervone. She was inducted in 2014 and stick around after because I catch up with her later. Then the beauty, artistry, and magic of Patrick Schwan. He was inducted in 2012. By the way, his doc won Best Short at the Palm Springs Film Festival. Oh yeah. And then we head out to the Hamptons in Eastern Long Island with Bates Massey, inducted in 2013. I am very intuitive about my work. In the beginning, I listen. Listening to the people and listening, listening. Until I have some things that I can, you know, a little um, feel. A little... Oh, a yes, thread, a thread. A thread that I can start to, mm. and then something uh, starts. I love forms and objects. I love to put the pieces in some way is just the only thing that I, I think I know to do in life. <laughs> it's just to do this, and this yes. is my, my pleasure. I am Brazilian, but I don't try to make a Brazilian architecture. It's always according to the client. Mm. I was chosen by him because he envisioned his house through my eyes. It's the same if you want to be painted, let's say, by a surrealistic way or a cubist way, then you choose Picasso or you choose Dali or the way that you have something in common. I am a very curious man. Architecture is just one of my passions. Music and films come before. For sure, I love uh, Radiohead, it's my favorite band. But I love Jean Gilberto. Coisa mais bonita A genius in Brazil. I love Kanye West. And 
classical music. I try to mix films, music and architecture in very short films, almost like if you are opening the door, you, you look like this and you close the door. direct, in a way, your feelings through the, the architecture. Were you always allowed to be so free in your thinking? Uh, in the beginning, I was doing art. And then I started doing separate films. What were these films about? Humor. Not comedies. Right. It's more Jacques Tati's mm -hmm. humor. I try to, to turn the table in every project, to do something that will surprise me and then eventually could surprise other people. I hate modern food. The food that you have <laughs> one piece here and one it. there is just beautiful. It's not comfortable. And this is the same in architecture. This is what I try to do all my life, to have a very simple design, very simple solutions, a plan very well developed, but places that invite you to stay and to see it. It was in 1973, I started working with a very important architect in Brazil, Jacob Rusti, and he did the most interesting projects. A very elegant man who introduced the interior architecture in university. Interiors are so important as architecture, in my opinion, that I cannot design the interior if it's not my architectural project. And the same, I would never design something without designing the interiors also. This is Jardim. I venture to say that I've never seen anything as lush and beautiful in New York. Oh. You see the skylights mm -hmm. here? So where will the building be? Near Zaha Hadid's new building in the High Line. It's the next building. I think I act more as an art director mm -hmm. than as an architect. I need to have control of everything. And this is why I'm so honored and happy to do the Four Seasons, because maybe they was the first one in the world to think from the logo to the dishes, the architecture. And this is exactly what I love to do. This came in a good moment of my life. Mm -hmm. But I have on my shoulders, you know, the expectation <laughs> of... The whole world. The, the, the yes. whole world. Even now, I don't know if I'm an architect. <laughs> you know, it's true. I am doing things because people call me, but uh, it's just one thing in my life. A Portuguese teacher that I had, he rented uh, wild strawberries from Ingmar Bergman, and I was 14 years old, and this changed my whole life. He said that the first phrase in a text and the last one were very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. In my projects, the first feeling when you enter the space or the last reaction. When you live, you live with something always. The 
process of doing architecture is fascinating. You work and you work and you work over, but suddenly you feel a crack when the pieces are, something happened in the, the plans, the sketches, that you feel when it's ready. And this is a magical moment. And this, I, I still love to do what I do because of this magical moment. Poi questo fai solo metà, quelli o basta, ho fatto troppo. Ancora vuoi fare? No, no, ancora un pochino. Tutto col pelo, eh. Veramente non taglio. You know, design for me is like uh, when you want to make an omelet. I want to make a good omelet for you. But if you don't like porcini, I can make a good omelet with zucchini. I don't try to convince you that porcini is very good. If you don't like, you don't like. I make another omelet. Oh my goodness, Paola. This is my roof. And your little fish welcoming us. The fish is the welcome <laughs> Chinese it. fish. I mean, this is you. Like you walk into a designer's home and this represents how they think about the world and of design, right? I never really designed my apartment. I designed the architecture and then uh, somehow is a is an accumulation of things one by one all this piece. Interesting. All my exercises build on curiosity. Curiosity and travel. Every day you capture something. Noise, sound, food, smell, color. Everything goes in a big basket without logic. The deciding what to do it's very fast exercise. Well, I have this idea coming up in the basket and then I just take it out. Can you tell me what you were like as a young child? Were you creative? Mm, terrible child. In what way? Mm, because I was uh, really systematically doing the opposite of what I was asked to do. I never liked the school since day one. So um, I heard that there were people around the world doing interesting project. UFO in Florence were doing like a theater in the street. Uh, Archigram, uh, Archizoom. Uh, they are all architects, but they managed to do something else. Mendini one morning called me and asked me if I want to come to Milano because he was uh, having a magazine, very famous magazine called Casabella. So I came to Milano to work and then I'm still here, more or less. For us, young designer was the possibility to be different from the very important Italian design. I was very happy because I was working in something that uh, was a real job, but there was a, always a little component of fun. We were putting a lot of attention on the skin done into the real structure of uh, the design, giving a lot of attention to the surface. 
I love this material, cemental. Yeah, I love and it. And I decided to make some pattern, little bit graphic, because uh, I want to give a contemporary image with the traditional technique. Right. Because you like to do things that are a little off, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I like to do installation very much because it's concentration of energy and after four days disappear. Wow. <laughs> so now we go to Palazzo. Yeah. <laughs> and we are going to see beautiful textile. She's so modest. Yeah. <laughs> So the big innovation of Paola and what we loved her for is her color palette. Yes. When you look at them, you want to live yeah. with them and to do play with combination, which are fabulous. Yeah. This is to die for. Fantastic. I would make a coat out of this. <laughs> look. Ah, now you can see. Gorgeous. I can work everywhere and I can have roots everywhere. Many people ask where is home. There are thousand places that I like and I feel at home. When I land in Hong Kong, I feel already at home. And I love Southeast Asia very much. Everybody was working by hand. I discover uh, weaving, all the world of ceramic, when I was coming back, I was trying to convince the, the industry to be more curious about craft. Use that capacity to produce something that looks very modern. Hotels or public spaces is a little bit like a theater for the actors who are going to take advantage of that space. I always had this attraction to the color of the water, the color of the sky, the liquid color. Because always I like with water, I like water and I like fish, I'm a fish. So here is a project of Playsmat for a restaurant, Korean restaurant we are designing in uh, Paris. This is the sample of the material, of the floor, on the wall and the ceiling. Dipped in the color. Look at this. Wow. We are working about very spectacular material. It's beautiful. It's a very traditional material. Right. But the, the way we use it... It's quirky, it has very, personality. You know, it's very strange, you know? Yeah. <laughs> These things, uh, sometimes when they look, they say, oh, you want bad. No, I don't want bad. I want not perfect. I promote imperfection. Like in the Dodo shop, for example, the brown glue is the glue that in the bathroom they use to glue their tiles. This is the material I use on the wall. So how many dodo shops have you designed? Oh, many, many, oh, many. Many, many, many. The point of view of the client, technical issue, cost, uh, are not barriers. I like to consider them as an element of the design. I love caviar. But in the same way, I like anchovies. You need to have a counterpart who like to play this game. Baxter makes everything here. They really make the sofa from A to Z. So the cow arrive, the sofa go to the track. Oh. <laughs> they have their knowledge and I can use it again in a special way. Design is a job. I always try to explain that to the young designer in Asia because they always say, I'm the artist. I say, no, you're not the artist, you are the designer, which is something else. 
but you have a very open idea about what is beautiful or how to use things that are everyday that makes them extraordinary or very, very special. Yeah, but this is my attitude of curiosity to put together things. I mean, I, it's totally without rules. The only rules is the curiosity and then uh, at the end to have a good omelet. Hey everybody, we're about to go live with the brilliant and magical Paola Navoni. And she's coming right now, hang on. Ciao! Paola! <laughs> Ciao, Paola! How are you? Oh my God, I'm so... <laughs> oh, Paola, I'm so happy to see you. Me too. Who oh. cares about design? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you look you you look beautiful. I miss you. I miss New York. I miss I going around. I'm really desperate. I know. I know. I can imagine. We are really, we are really in a bad, uh, bad situation. I know, I know. So Paola, it's been, uh, so I think it's been six years since we inducted you in the Hall of Fame. Wow. <laughs> A long time now, right? Long time, long time. Yeah. I know. And so, so tell us, like, Paola, how, how are you doing? You spent the summer in Greece, right? Yeah. I was, uh, no, my summer was lucky, very lucky because, um, it was possible to go to Greece, so I just went there to do nothing as usual in my yeah. island. It was a kind of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the house anyway, looking at the sea, or I'm in the sea, da da da. I mean, it was nothing. It was really beautiful, really yeah. relaxing, but it was not a real life. Mm -hmm. It was very, very strange strange summer right for sure now now Paola, i saw that beautiful house that you finished um oh yeah that renovation of that incredible house tell it tell me about that one uh, this uh, this kind of was a friend who uh, the family uh, has this house since a long time mm, several years and this is in one of the most beautiful uh, places in Sardinia. One of the first few houses that were built was uh, five minutes by swimming, swim to the Piazzetta of San Rafa, of Rafael Piazzetta. So wow. it was really beautiful. But you have no impression to be there because it's like a, it's a garden, yeah. round yeah. garden like this with the houses in the middle and the garden it goes down to a slope and at the end you have a little beach. So if you don't open the door to go to, to do your grocery or whatever, you, you can believe today in Sardinia to be in the middle of nowhere. Wow. Vegetation was a, such a beautiful vegetation, already old, and then they, we rearranged some more. The really amazing place. Unbelie unbelievable. Yeah. I, I, love, I love that. Um, I saw that the wall of, so the fish have now become the family of, of sea. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes, because we need the, uh, uh, we need some uh, light inside, so we hang some fish mirror around. Then we design for the children a special uh, uh, one mirror that looks like a crab, and one other looks like a whale. So each one has his own uh, little uh, marine uh, uh, compound in the house, in this room. And, and, Talking about my uh, love for craft, yes, I felt in love with a uh, with an Iron Man. The, he's do, this gentleman is doing iron like in the Middle Age. 
wow. right in the middle age. And he worked this iron and that looks like a soft material. Mm. So it was, a, it was a, a crazy story because I asked him to do something. He was going away, boom, boom, come, come back with something else. But <laughs> it was always very beautiful. Wow, so wow. I, I designed this, uh, um, how do you call it, like a balcony to yes, protect Yes, it's like people. a railing, right? A railing. Yes. Yeah. But I don't want, you know, there was a sea view, plant, tree, and I don't want the line to cut. Right. In horizontal way, they stick. So I told him, why can you do some grass yeah. like this with uh, in metal? So we have this beautiful, uh, balustrade but yeah. it doesn't look a balustrade it looks a line of uh, fantastic uh, iron grass it is very very beautiful incredible and it is so you on your like always searching for and something it's also, and it's also yeah. a surprise yeah. because i was not even dreaming to design something like this as usual this uh, very very special and unique project come out with a with a meeting with a, a person that you don't even know who exists since uh, one day before yeah yeah but i think those kind of people you you attract them they attract you. <laughs> it's like, like uh, <laughs> yeah it's so and, and wait i have to say that there's a there's a thatched roof over a terrace or something but it reminds me of the ceiling light with the little tips of blue oh <laughs> so beautiful power. oh yes that's that is a, another craft this guy make basket mm. and he make this basket for me and then he put a little blue on the air of the basket the basket is like a like a like a house of a bird ah yeah it is yeah. it's like a nest it also is so we find a lot of uh, basket of course in in uh, in um, textile and basket because in Sardinia there are still people doing these things. Right, right. It is, it is magical. But you know, it's, a, it's, it's very, it's very bad because nobody, you know, give a larger opportunity. You know, it's a, this was an accident, a good accident that I felt into this guy. But right. And then, um, I have to say, I was not looking for it, but for the basket, which I know, I went around uh, Sardinia to look all the basket maker and I order basket from many of them. But the, the metal, I just saw something nice. So I start to ask who is making this, always oh, a man. And this guy told me that when he was a child, seven years like that, he was already, uh, in a father um, workshop, he was playing with this oh, really? metal, yeah, making oh. uh, soft the metal through the uh, through the fire. Right, right. But you know, like that one is such an example of that <laughs> imperfectness that you love, right? Everything is so handmade on that; it's unbelievable. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. You have to do something else with him. He's a special. <laughs> The special, yes. one. The special one. Yeah. So, so Paula, tell us what's going on. You know, hospitality obviously has been hit really hard. Um, I know you did. I know. I know. I know you did a renovation though recently, right? You finished a renovation. Was it in Como? Yeah, it was in uh, Toscany in a castle with a beautiful land. And this was for Como Hotel. Right. Right. And the, the name is Castello del Nero, is the name of the family who own this castle. This is, uh, let's say, we are in a, such a step um, where they can now open next uh, season, they will open. But the land, the land is so beautiful. There are 7,000 olive trees. You can go around. It's really very, very fantastic place. Then I'm working in a, in a hospitality project, unfortunately, in, uh, unfortunately, because we are late and we right. have a, 
we had one year delay, so for us it's a very big catastrophe. In uh, Florence, in the center right. of Florence. And That's going to be a big one, right? That's going to be a big one. This is a fantastic story. I hope you can come for the opening at this yes. point. Yes, I will. I will. So, so, so tell me something like the the Castello de Nero. Um, they're they're doing it in parts. Is that how, that's how they're slowly opening up, and how you're designing it? No, no. Last year we did an upgrade, like a oh. lifting of the room oh, yeah. and everything. This year we uh, renovate the spa completely, the spa, and now they can open again. Ah. Yeah, uh, because they is, they, this, this, this is finished. They can open and then there are more projects inside the land because they are villas, but this is not, not in the picture yet. So that's the project is finished and then we're still working in, the, in, in this place in Florence because this is a crazy, fantastic, it's like a... Um, spectacular uh, movie story you have to you have to see i cannot yeah yeah so are they what are they what are they planning just in terms of i'm, I'm sure you're talking to them just about they're thinking of opening next year Is yeah that april, april april no oh. we have to open in april we are working uh, very 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 much if we, my only uh, concern i hope uh, they are not going to stop the work on site so that we have to check we have to control everything very well but we have uh, less worker than before the problem but still uh, plenty of them in the site right so that's right. why they have to slow down because we cannot put so many people together to work yeah. right now they are less they are everybody is very 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 closely check and uh, nobody can enter and we are working i hope you come for the opening I, because this too. will be very fun oh me. yeah i would love i would love that boy oh boy okay wait so i know that you just did an installation like a glamping installation right in rimini that happened yeah. right <laughs> yes 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 because i was uh, you know i'm here a little bit uh, uh, compressed because uh, and I was you know dreaming about a new possibility so I we met this fantastic uh, uh, tent producer so I made this installation with very very expensive and chic furniture all Baxter sofa bed Baxter bed and everything with the was a kind of uh, fantastic proposal to push people to use this kind of architecture yes which is flexible uh, is 50 percent cheaper than build a normal room mm -hmm. and you can also make your uh, in 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 uh, in asia and in africa they know they have this kind of uh, idea of having a luxury uh, accommodation right. with tent but in Europe doesn't exist tent is when you don't have money you go to right. the camping and there is still we still have this yeah. kind of uh, uh, mentality yeah. yeah so we want to show that the, you can make a fantastic seven-star hotel in a south of Italy like this yeah, I love that in Greece a kind of Mediterranean version uh, where investor can also take advantage of the fact that now that we also all have a money problem uh, you you invest uh, half of the money in your uh, and anyway this very good producer they give you 10 year of uh, guarantee warranty guarantee yeah, yeah. So after 10 years also an, a, a normal uh, hotel room need to be renovated, so it's not it's not so crazy from the business point of view. Also, right? Okay, wait. If first of all, is looking for my idea. This is cool. I first of all, I love it. The tent is fabulous. And yeah. are you going to try to like? Are you going to try to add it 
something to your studio or in Greece or something? Here I cannot do anything anymore because I go in jail. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. We we'll see. We we'll see. I uh, love it. We would like to do a version, a New York version for this, but you will have to find a possibility for me to come to New York and make an installation or in I'm one sorry. roof. You know, because okay. now you have a lot of uh, people planting vegetable, gardening on the roof. Sure. So why not, from the uh, building point of view, this is something that you can dismantle. So it's not uh, against the rule of the whatever city regulation. Yeah. No? Yeah. And can be wonderful for, I don't know, one week or one month to have an installation where somebody also have maybe a garden and we make the plant in, in the, and then we put uh, your office underneath. I love it. We'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get, we're going to find you a roof. You want a roof, we're going to find you a roof. And we can have, yes. a, slumber, we can have a slumber party there. <laughs> yes, good. I love that. All right, yeah. so, that, so that's going to happen. So maybe you have to change your uh, venue for all your things. Why not? Eh? I can do that for you. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, thinking <laughs> I'm right there with you. So Paola, so you had a lot of product that was getting ready for Milan. Oh, uh, we, uh, uh, yeah. So yes. should we, let's do a little, let's do a little um, Paola recap. <laughs> we work with so many clients. So let's start with your pals at Natuzzi. But this is uh, this year was the year of the beautiful sofa. I don't know yes. some stars position. Uh -huh. uh, and then the project was uh, very very mm, soft. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Good. I did one of my projects where design is okay, but the design is also very uh, friendly with you. Very accommodating and very yeah that yeah yeah and well so let's so as you said it was the year of the sofa for you so yes. then then a uh, baxter which i had the best time with you in their factory we had such a good time <laughs> but, yeah such and nice you talk about the cow coming and the, the, cow, <laughs> the cow comes in the sofa goes out that was the best line well you have a few really good lines <laughs> Uh, so yeah, what's, the we, well, what's the name of this one? Again, there's research on the ladder is never stopped. So they really, and I want to have this one, uh, this year, something that there was already some kind of bad feeling in the air. Yeah. So I wanted the product to really be for the people, with the people. Doesn't matter if I look, uh, but uh, okay, but I want the people to feel okay. It's also the year of the of the feeling for me. Not so yeah. easy, huh? No, it's not. But you're like that anyway, because even <laughs> even you with food and bringing people together, you're you're just like that. It comes from inside, no? Yeah. Yes. We try not to oppressed by the situation and also this job is a nice job but it's a job it's not a religion you see right right and you you always make sure to tell young kids that too right you're not an artist <laughs> you're a designer no. which is a big difference which is a big difference exactly <laughs> so there's another collection by Gervasoni the law right yeah, also the also Javazoni for the first time also was able to really, really uh, make alive uh, an idea which is really the, the project is the comfort. Yeah. So Javazoni very new because you know it, it's not a specific uh, product for them. And uh, I'm very happy because this one is, uh, again, is a kind of um, ghost, mm. which everybody knows, everybody has. Yeah. But in the uh, 10 years after, a little bit older, a little bit more um, inclusive. Yeah. 
really fantastic. Okay, wait, we have to talk about the the watermelon cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> I love the what the that limited edition, right? Yes. There is the, this company which is a very famous because was the company who through the 30 years always support um designer from uh, before super studio and then alchemia yeah. and then memphis and he always support all the exhibition made by abed laminati everything was produced by this man who was wow. also a uh, supporter on this uh, uh, all this adventure and uh, he said he, he came up with an idea i said well i would like to make some uh, a long time that we don't have exhibition about with a laminate. Uh, I would like to make few limited edition right. just to just to remember people that we don't have any. Um, we we are not lost. We are right. still here, right. and we want to uh, we want to be in the in the design world. So I said, okay, fine. Limited edition has to be limited, right. so we can really put a lot of energy, a lot of fun. Uh, and then uh, we, had, uh, we had a fruit um, stall. <laughs> One was a uh, kiwi, uh, we make a uh, kiwi, we made the cabinet about uh, with watermelon cabinet, and we had uh, the dragon fruit, ah, the dragon one, uh, Chinese, which is violet and beautiful, yeah. and green outside. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing. Wait, the company is De Rosso, right? De Rosso, yes. Yeah, they also do those, you also do those beautiful perforated cabinets, right? With yeah. that. Yeah. Oh. Yes, this I, I did that. it for me. This I did it for me, but because I need a space to put all my my dinnerware that still come from all over the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. We have to talk about uh, food because you must have been doing even more cooking than you normally do. And you're a pretty amazing cook. The first, last, we had a lockdown. You know, right. before the summer, we had a three months lockdown. So the first month I was in Trieste and was very wow. nice because, you know, out of Milano, the situation was not as tough as Milano. So uh, Gennaro was with me, so we wrote a full book of uh, recipe. And now we have uh, 100 uh, recipe ready to go somewhere. <laughs> oh my God. Well, first of all, you know my husband is from Trieste. Ah, so. from Trieste. Yeah, he's from Trieste. It was so funny. Then we did also, uh, we cook crazy things that never, you never cook because you need three days to cook. Right. No, we need in Trieste in uh, uh, Easter they do this very special meat in the jelly. Amazing. Wait, <laughs> what was your favorite recipe that you? We we uh, as you know I don't have a favorite. I have, I like everything. That's everything. Why, <laughs> that's why our scale is where it is. <laughs> but but uh, also we bought wine from the region because. And it was so funny because we called to buy wine and the producer said, oh, thank you so much. You know, nobody's calling. Everybody is locked down. It's okay. Send wine. Send oh, some more. Please. Send some more. Oh, so, I, I love that. It's very funny because, you know, also the people are uh, sometimes, uh, anyway, it's not a good time. Doesn't, I don't I, see any positive point in this time if i tell you if you want to answer the question don't ask i'm not, I'm not gonna answer this. i'm really fed up paula is fed uh, up now the the second best line of the hall of fame or maybe the best line was if you don't like my design try my <laughs> yes we think we are thinking a little bit for a food project with gennaro i will we will let you know well, listen, first of all, I love your honesty. There's no one like you, Paolo. You're like, you know what? This is a mess. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> Let's get beyond it. Well, listen, I, first of all, I appreciate you so much. You're bringing me so much joy just seeing you. 
And yeah, she, me too. I'm so happy that. Uh, me, me too. I can't wait for us to be together again. <laughs> uh, of course. You look for a rooftop. I'm and look for the we organize for you to have a rooftop uh, tent uh, event uh, office or whatever. Okay? It's, it's going to happen. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Well, a big virtual hug to you. Sending Ciao. so much love. Love you so Ciao. much. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Bye bye. Ciao. 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 <laughs>often there is a, a, a critique about uh, consumerism but we can't stop inventing things we have to invent things we can't decide that all the objects are good and we don't need another chair or another spoon or another car that's not true we need them because we need to think we need to create we need to do new things we accomplish ourselves all humans in creation, in invention. So design for me is superhuman. This one is called the pasta pot. Pasta okay, pot. So it's a, it's a tool. Right. So okay, you are cooking the risotto and after you have this spoon, okay, right, you don't know to what do to do. It. So you put it here, it becomes very messy. So the idea was to put it inside the handle, okay? When we design an object, we design also the gesture. So, yeah, we talk a little bit about functionality. Of course, this is a casserole and how I hold it, how I use it. But there is a beauty in how we use it, and the pleasure, and where I put my hand, what is the contact with the material. At the Centre Pompidou, I had this show on, the, on my uh, career as a designer. A one-man show. Yeah, the one-man <laughs> show. I wanted to explain to the public what is design. You understand, from my father, I love technology, I love techniques, I love uh, how things are made. And you can't draw anything if you don't know how they are made. It's a part of the process. My mother is a nurse and my father is a craftsman. When I was young, my parents were not very rich, so all the furniture was done by him and my mother. And I will help him. I remember just holding a piece of steel like this and he's welding. You know, when you weld, you have sparkles, you have a lot of, the light is very powerful, so you can't look at it. And me, I'm closing my eyes like this and, and, and it's burning, it's tickling, you know, your hand. But I was proud, I was a, and I was learning. I didn't know. But all these years, I was just learning processes. I think of Patrick Joie as a kind of age of reason, 18th century wunderkammer kind of <laughs> designer, where it's a natural collision and orchestration 
of nature, science, and art. Me, I'm, uh, I'm coming from a very old age, I'm just using my pencil and a piece of paper. Okay? I don't know how to do the 3D things. So we decide, let's use this incredible new technology of rapid prototyping. This object is made in a machine, which is full of dust, dust of plastic. Mm. And there is not one screw, not, no, one, uh, no one has assembled these pieces. They are all made in one shot. That's why I call it one shot. Wow. In one time in the machine. That's amazing. Technology, it's like a new instrument. It's like a, a Alice in Wonderland. You open a little door and behind you have an incredible space of freedom. And you, you, you are with your machete and you can, you can go, you can, you, can, you can do whatever you want. It's uh, freedom, it's incredible. And in design, every time you have a new technology, you have a new aesthetic. So I call this lamp Bloom. And I wanted to, to even go even deeper in the complexity, but at the same time, it's always, there is always a function behind. Complexity or simplicity, it's the same for the machine. But you see the beauty also of just the movement. Okay, something like this. And you can see all the pieces all assembled inside the machine. When he uses technology, he uses it in such a way that it's wondrous. He created, they're really artifacts, momentous occasions where this technology realized for the first time ever an object in a new way. I think design is uh, really in between these three things important for me. Art, craftsman, materials, technology, my father, and empathy, my mother. You always have to put yourself at the place of the people who will use the project, always. I thought I will only design furniture when I came out of a Stark Studio. Okay, that's what I like to do and I enjoy it. I will do that all my life. I will design chairs. Okay, no problem. And my first commission is uh, the chef, Alain Ducasse. It's a big French chef. We work very well together and he asked me to design his restaurant. And I'm very happy because I didn't know I wanted this. You know, it was something, it was hidden inside me. And you have someone who's saying, would you like to design a restaurant? Oh, yes. Yes. The Plaza Atene Bar, it has really been my first big project. In Paris, uh, we are very lucky. You have the Eiffel Tower. Well, it's true for us uh, French, you go once, but you look at it every day. It's so important. It represents a modernity which will not have failed. An happy modernity, an happy progress. And that's what we have injected in the, the Eiffel Tower. The restaurant is called Le Jules Verne. The Eiffel Tower is 10,000 tons. And we are not allowed to put one kilo. So when we have demolished the restaurant, we have weighed everything. Okay? And everything we have put, it, we are too heavy. So we have worked with carbon fiber to make it light. Since the beginning, the studio is organized on these three bays, the furniture, the architecture, and the industrial design. And one day, someone is asking me to design a house, a huge house in Malaysia. And it was our first architectural project. And while we were doing this with Sanjit, it becomes very evident that we wanted to do more architecture. So I asked him to become my associate. And uh, now we are like a rock band or a jazz band. We are playing together, we are making music together. We designed uh, this project on the Place Vendôme in Paris with Van Cleef and Arpels. Their spirit, the way they design things, is very close to what I do. The, the relation with organic shapes, with sensuality, uh, with uh, nature, with beauty, it's already in our work. Uh, yes, we have many projects. 
I have designed in Paris the bicycle system, I have designed also the toilet system and the advertising system. Now we are working on the bus stop and also this taxi sign. I like this idea of this object which is just going all around like this and, and like a, a dance. I love New York. It's a, a city, I, I really, it's incredible. In New York we design Gilt at the New York Palace Hotel and mix Alain Ducasse restaurant. A project is taking us to another city in the US, Las Vegas. Here we are on top of a tower, 43rd floor, and we have emptiness again. And I like this, what can I put in this emptiness? And we are surrounded by the desert, so I put a cloud, water. And we have made a huge chandelier with 14,000 bubbles made in Murano in Italy with blown glass. They are all different. It's called ether. Ether? Uh -huh. yeah, and the made... shape's not perfect. Yeah, exactly. Right. This idea of imperfection, it's catching the light. When we design, we want to design everything from the chair to the spoon to the light. So when you come in, you never saw it before. It's a new thing, it's a new impression, and you will go out and you will never see it. You have to come back. Because we are not designing architecture, we are not designing objects, we are designing a moment. We are inventing a memory, a future memory. We are uh, inventing a mood. And I like also creating a space where you don't know exactly where you are, especially a bar. Because in the bar, maybe you want to be someone else. And I think the space can help you to be the one you would like to be for maybe a few minutes. What do you imagine yourself to be in this bar? Uh, <laughs> me, uh, just, just a designer. <laughs> hey everybody, this is Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design. You know, today more than ever, we're gonna need designers and architects who are always looking at things as if for the first time. Those who design with humanity, empathy, and vision, and a whole lot of talent. Um, and I can't think of a better pair than my dear friends, um, Juan Mancou, Patrick Juan, and Sanjeev Mancou. Um, <laughs> they literally build at all scales from the spoon to the city, industrial design, product design, interiors, they do it all and always with an eye for innovation and a hand for craftsmanship. These are my dear friends. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Sanji. Hello. Hi. Uh, greetings from Paris. I know, isn't it? You know, that is the one mm. blessing of all this is somehow we're connecting in a different way that we never expected, right? Yeah, it's great. You know what I mean? And, and the weird thing is, you know, it's th this type of connection, you know what I mean? You really kind of crave human connection. And, and one of the things that we've seen in this period it's really great to see inside the houses and the homes of all yeah. the people who you work with. Yeah, that's so that's true. Great. That's so true. Except I set up, I, I do like a setup, but um, I might let people peek in once in a while. <laughs> and Patrick, you, get people, you get people's kids who kind of walk through the space and then you kind yeah. of get all sorts of kind of crazy things. And all of a sudden you look at someone's house and I remember Patrick asked, you know, someone's like, uh, are you at your, uh, your parents' house? He's like, no, that's my house. He's like, wow. Oh, that's so that's your taste you know what I mean you get, to see, right. you get to see a lot of things because normally you mean a professional and personal I, are separated you know what I mean and now everything is mixed everything is it's 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 uh, I completely agree I completely agree yeah we get a different we definitely get a different taste I do um a live Instagram thing every day that Patrick did with me one day and um, yesterday, the, there were two partners and they brought their daughter and she ended up sitting on the lap for the whole time and she was the star of the whole thing. It was so much fun to see her and talk to her. Anyway, so first of all, um, how are your clients doing and how are you doing? Uh, us, we are. We are lucky, the lucky one. The lucky because we, uh, it was not so hard for us to, to work from home. Uh, because what we are using is just paper, pencil, and a computer. So, and we, we were still able to work, not like uh, people working in the restaurants and or people working so hard in the hospital. So uh, I think we, we are fortunate uh, to be able to keep on doing our, 
our job, our mission, our passion. Uh, so we are doing great. I think of you because you, your mom was a nurse, right? Yes. Your mom yes, was a yes. nurse. She, she, yeah, she, she's a nurse. I think I, I became a designer uh, also because of her. Uh, because right. uh, it, designing, it's curing also. You're trying to cure a problem to find a nice solution for a problem. And uh, also you are not doing it for yourself. You are always doing it for the other. And I, that's what a, a nurse is doing. They are, and that's what they are doing now every day. I never forget, um, it was a quote you did in one of the films we made, and you spoke about your mother and you used the word empathia, empathy, that she had so much empathy mm -hmm. and that's what you learned from her. And that's so beautiful because right now humanity, like being, being more humane is like top of everybody's thinking right now. Right, Sanji? Yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. And it, it's kind of a strange thing because <clears throat> as Patrick said, we're, we're, we're really quite fortunate that we can continue to do what we're doing. Uh, all that said and done, there's more stress, there's more work in a way than ever, you know, because uh, you're less efficient, you know what I mean? Uh, um, and there's, there's new challenges. You need to try to figure out how to keep people happy, how to keep people motivated. Uh, clients tend to be, uh, again, the support is unbelievable. You know what I mean? Uh, it's really, um, in these moments in time, you really cherish the fact that they put so much trust in you. You mean to go over and above the edge? You mean right. uh, a lot? Because we have a tendency to push people, the people who work for us, and especially our clients. Yeah. We tend to push them, you know, really quite hard. So at a certain point, you're kind of wondering, are they going to stick with you? But <laughs> they're great. You know, I mean, so it's really great. But it's um, it's it's a kind of a real strange mix of emotions. You know, what I mean, yeah. because you know, there's more family time than ever, which is super. But then you're trying to balance family and this and that. So. Like everyone else, you know, it's a it's it's a, a mixed bag of things, but you definitely know, definitely uh, changed for sure. Now, um, are your your clients? So let's let's talk about Alan because you've had you know, first of all, having a client that you have a real relationship, who in some ways gives you gave you big start in in this career, and somebody that all these years later you still are doing the most amazing projects with. I mean, how how is he doing, and how is how is the whole hospitality industry for him? Uh, so, so of course it's uh, it's tough for yeah. every uh, every bistro, every cafe, every uh, every restaurant uh, in the world, uh, and it's touching. Uh, it's not essential uh, to uh, to go in the restaurant. Uh, it's not essential, but uh, it's essential. Uh, in terms of like beauty, beauty is essential. Uh, it makes you happy. It gives you joy, and to be uh, also with uh, your friend, to be uh, together, to it's essential. We have to create, and so uh, everything is closed, and uh, so we are working like crazy. You can't imagine to find the solutions uh, to reopen all these restaurants, to create an, an elegant. Uh, uh, way to make this distance between people. So that's why we are working like a, with, with him and we want to make the best restaurants COVID free. COVID yeah, you free. said no, you no. sent some beautiful, uh, first of all, we have some projects that I want to, I want to share, but you did send over also, you're doing um, all these sketches that uh, that I guess you're sharing or going back and forth with Alan or talking to him about. Um, so yes, the masks, but there are other beautiful screenings that you were, I see in some of the sketches. Yes, I, I, there is one, imagine you go in the restaurants and you are eating with someone you, you don't know so much. And maybe you, you don't want to, to give him the COVID because you, you have it, you don't know. So you have to put a screen in between you and me. Not easy, huh? So I have designed something very simple, which is just a, a piece of transparent material, ultra thin. Uh, but when you put this, you see yourself. It's like a mirror. So you don't want to eat with yourself. You want to eat with the one uh, in front of you, okay? So uh, my father made uh, the first prototype. 
and he, he, he had a dinner with my mother uh, with the first prototype. So he did? He really? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we find a way, we, we curve it. So give this idea to, to everyone. We, we curve this piece of transparent plastic. And so you don't have any reflection. Mm. Okay. Very simple. And uh, he told me that after five minutes, uh, he, he totally forget about it. Uh, and uh, his problem was he was scared that he would smash it because he couldn't see it. Ah. Sanji, did we you have... see this? Did you see this, Sanji? No, 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 I did. We didn't have a chance to, 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 ah. to see it uh, yet. Yeah. Very okay. interesting. So, so let's let's talk about let's talk about beauty because <laughs> we want to get back to those restaurants. By the way, I think once we're once who knows once they have a vaccine or we find a way to be clean from it, we're all going to eat out every day for the rest of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> But you have this beautiful relationship with Alan, right? No, it's. Uh, I think he, he, he was. Um, he could have uh, become a designer, an architect. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's it's uh, amazing because he is a kind of person who can't stand problems. He needs to find a solution for the problem. So, as a client for a designer uh, like us. It's great because right. he's, he's, he's always pushing us to be more creative. Uh, and he, he, he doesn't know exactly how to draw. Even if he draw, I think, pretty well, he draw his dishes. First time I saw, I said, oh, I will cook this. I, and he made a, a plate and he, he designed the, he draw what you're going to eat la later. But wow. uh, uh, so, he likes to see, and when you propose a, a good idea, I think he likes it. Let's let's do it. Let's make it. So it's a a rare uh, a rare uh, client for sure uh, to uh, to be passionate and uh, to love design. He goes to the flea market all the time, and uh, he has a. I think he loves object more than us. Mm. <laughs> We there were objects in the that in the restaurant. Um, we well, first of all we had the most beautiful dinner together at the restaurant at the Plaza Atene. It was like one of the most special things. By the way, I have to tell you guys that I felt bad because you know I did this big posting about it. Like it took me like three days, and I posted the best pictures. And then afterwards, I realized. They're never on Instagram. They never saw any of this. It made me feel so bad. Now you guys have to get Sorry. digital. No, it's okay. I felt bad. It was my thank you. And it was so nice. And you never saw it. Okay. But he, but there was the, that whole wall in the back with all these beautiful, what I can, now I can't remember what they, what they were, but all, all these beautiful objects or silver. Remember what was it? There was silver, uh, crystal, and old pots and pans mm. uh, that were in copper. Right. And they were a kind of a, a combination of kind of this this mix between uh, excellence in French savoir faire or capacity to make beautiful things that are uh, useful that are for everything from this weird machine that kind of crushes a duck so you can get its blood so you can make a syrup out of it. Right. From the kind of Oh, yeah, that's kind of the duck press. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, the, the kind of, and if you've <laughs> ever seen one in working, it's the sound will haunt you for uh, the rest of your life. No, thank but you. These amazing, amazing pieces that are part of his collection, part of this collection of uh, 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 of a bigger group of people. And as Patrick said, he's ferociously creative. I mean, mm. he's not just a neck. He's he's ferocious, and you know. There's a with with both I think Alain and uh, the family Eberlin as well. There's something different when you collaborate with somebody to help them. Uh, you're playing in the sandbox to look at what the future should be. Right. Oh, you know, and, and they have a very very strong, you know, personal way of doing something and something that they want to do. And as you as you help them, and it's not really part of a business. It's not because they're just a client. You're just kind of your kids playing in the sandbox together, inventing the future. And the bond goes, it's, it's much deeper. I, I remember 
I, I was incredibly touched, obviously, with the projects that we do. But uh, Alain was um, was the first. He gave us the first gift when my child was born. Mm -hmm. Literally the day that she was born, the day Aww. you mean that we kind of set everything out. Like that afternoon, the Corsier came, and you mean there's this beautiful little bowl. Uh, you mean the to go back to the kitchen, and then kind of afternoons. You mean with the the family Eberlin and, and really just kind of eating in their houses. It's it goes it goes much beyond being a client. You mean that there's 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 another bond that happens that's energetic or something else, and it's it's quite a special thing. That's so beautiful. Okay, so there's a few. Now there's a lot of projects that I do know, um, and you've won many for best of year. Um, but there's a few that you sent that I don't know. So the one, the Dorchester in London, is that was that opened or was that opening? Is that open? It, yeah, it, it, it opened earlier this year, ah. and um, it, it's strange. You know, we've been uh, around the block a little bit, Patrick and myself, <laughs> doing things <laughs> together. And so uh, we're in this, uh, we're starting to start this phase of uh, re-looking at projects that we've done before. Mm. So the Plaza Athenae, we've done three times, uh, we've done the bar twice now. Uh, and so now this was the second, the second shot for the, the Dorchester, uh, Alain de Castle de Dorchester uh, with the Dorchester group. And then so there it was, uh, it was a, a nice kind of remake. And it's always a strange thing. Um, you push people in the beginning, to do something that you are uh, convinced is going to be strong and yeah. it's going to help them for the future so that you know products have a long life right but that means you know like anything you've got to think of it's going to be finished in three years and then it still has to have a good life for another five ten years five, after yeah. you're, you're imagining trying to imagine 15 years in the future mm -hmm. and that tends to freak people out you mean because when you kind of show them something it's it's usually way too avant-garde for most people to handle but the strange thing is then they get used to it and then they, then they appropriate it and then it becomes their thing. And then after a while, it's like, you can do whatever you want, but just don't touch that one thing. Oh. <laughs> and of course, when, when they give it to Patrick and myself, it's the first thing we're like, um, that's okay, gotta go. Okay, okay, what's the budget, the time? Okay, okay, you know, so I think we're gonna keep all this except for that. That, yeah. that that's the thing that, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's gotta go. We're, we're gonna do it again. And then you see keep people like, no, <laughs> no, come on, play, no, come uh, on, come on. You don't have to do that. Like, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I yeah. remember take out the, the tooth time, and gotta... the first time we present this ID uh, of this uh, place in the middle of the restaurant where you you go inside and you are nobody can see you anymore. You disappear in the in the smog of London inside the restaurant, like whoop, disappear, <laughs> and you can hear around you. You have people, but you don't see them. So. We, t we call it la table lumière. Okay, it's a French word, okay, but the table of light, I don't know how you can translate it, but it's, yeah. it's like fog. When we had the ID, uh, the, we, we said, oh, it's just, we believe strongly in the ID. We think it's beautiful, but who will accept something like this? Right, right. And, uh, and it's not easy, it's risky, it's like, a, wow. And, and now, it's a part of the, the place. It's the thing. We yeah, can't touch it. Yeah, it's the thing. What's so beautiful is this, is the, that the fog, it like lifts, right? From the white to the black. So that's, that's, why, that, that's why we changed it. So before it used to be all white and it was great as a first idea, but it was just a first sketch. And then, so it was really, you know, with time, you, you always have, it's a weird sensation. You, you're happy that you did it in the first place. Yeah, we yeah. did it. Yeah. And then about, a month later, after you've had some sleep, you kind of look at it again and say, oh, man, but you know, we, we only went that far and we could have gone right. that far. Right. But looking at it again, so it's exactly what you're saying. So it was a bit too wedding cake. You know what I mean? It was too simple and white on white. Then so we needed to have this mystery of, as Patrick was saying, you're saying the fog, it's not uniform, right? It's not exactly a cloud. It's fading in and out. And then it's also the form. It used to be really just basic and simple. And now it's got this kind of curve on the bottom. It's got more mystery. It's got more layers to it. And then so, yeah, and then there's always the same thing. It's like, how do we clean it? How do we do upkeep? And so right. there's always this kind of balance between trying to invent new things and then to making sure that they're practical and letting everyone get used to it at the same time. So as we said before, we push people. It's challenging. But in the end, it's, it's really for the clients. You mean, yeah, that, I, that bit of black and then the black chairs 
it's so it, it's so new like it feels feels really 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 new um okay wait there's some uh, let's talk about a few more so what about the uh the one at, the raffles in singapore the raffles hotel yeah yeah but this one was cool huh? because it's a it's a place we we know for so many years we know it's an iconic hotel in the history of uh, hotel and uh, to be able to 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 go there like at the plaza Atene, this kind of place uh, uh, we're so so proud to to touch it so they have renovated all the hotel and uh, and alain was given the the billiard room uh, and uh, it's a beautiful place also uh, uh, with history with this colonial uh, touch uh, surrounded by uh, uh, by the this uh, vibrant modern city uh, so it's one of the oldest <laughs> building in uh, in singapore mm. maybe not huh? but uh, one of the oldest so it has this uh, idea of uh, uh, what can i say uh, uh, james bond i don't know ah, something yeah. like this you know uh, the old james bond with uh, with sean <laughs> okay yeah. okay i get it <laughs> and, 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 I, and i love it and uh, the place is big and we it was about mediterranean the food about mediterranean and about uh, the, this idea of uh, mediterranean you know uh, spain italy france uh, uh, greece uh, morocco Algeria, you know, all all Mediterranean, all the food coming from Mediterranean, and so we we thought, okay, we will express this idea of uh, water, of uh, the water, but also mm -hmm. like a, a fish, like a big tuna fish, which is like a going and and is just going outside of the water, just uh, and will make a big splash. So it's just uh, this big object like this, which is a. Uh, a gigantic sculpture uh, and uh, with a shimmering with the, this light effect with the material it's made of carbon fiber to make it ultra light so every time you we do a project there is always uh, a moment where we we have to push the limit the limit because it, it's that's how we obtain the beauty surprise something you don't understand and so the all the the whole fish is made uh, of carbon fiber and and some other element but uh, it, it weights nothing wait can i just say one thing well, first of all if you were like a just graduating class and you're just getting out and you're doing your first big project and you were pitching somebody who said it's a fish and the fish is splashing in the water it just would be no <laughs> yeah, but you know i i would i always tell patrick whatever you do do not lose your french accent i know, I realized I know. That when I, we first met up that there's certain that's why i, I didn't say the word huh i didn't say he can get away with it with the I accent know. i try to do that it's like you know what I mean i know it's so it's so true it, but it, it, it's just, great but i just have to say that then then what comes out of that is such beauty and 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 sculpture it's like you always put in like sculpture into the work and and always like a piece of art and when you say that and when you're looking at it and you say that you go oh right that makes a lot of sense but if not it would have been really scary magic no but to you but what was great was that, that was that was one of the 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 rare ones where it was just it was the napkin sketch patrick just kind of had a had a reaction uh, at a meeting because really there's another project before that and then it was kind of getting a lukewarm reaction. And Patrick just kind of quickly just had a in uh, had a reaction. And for me, it's kind of typical because you know, at least for our work, it's based on kind of two things: it's uh, intuition and innovation. Right. Intuition is like it, and it's not the, the 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 flash thing. It's like, but you really feel that something needs yeah. to be there. You've got a, a, a reaction, and it, boom. And then uh, we spent two years working on that that intuition to craft it and. It was made in in uh, in Japan with people who make uh, carbon fiber race cars, which you mean to get this whole kind of crazy journey, and you know what I mean, uh, all sorts wow. of kind of crazy stuff to kind of get there. But but in the, in a way, it's like innovating. And how do we go farther? How does it go past just a, a first layer, second layer, this and that? And, and again, it's all just for that. What we don't get to see very much is you mean the the clients when they first walk through that door, right? right? And then just right. see it's all for that, right? And for, well, every, the whole, 
Yeah, every person then who comes in to eat there, right? It's, yeah. And, yeah, and then what do they feel like after half an hour, after an hour, do they come back again? And then what happens after the third visit when they realize the back of the tail's hovering and it's, oh. you know what I mean, it's floating and blah, 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 blah. But it's, it's, it's really about those kind of um, in life. Um, there are a lot of days that kind of melt into each other and that you tend to forget. You mean that sometimes a week can go by, a month can go by, and you kind of scratch your head and say, where did that month go? And then I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to stop that kind of weird progression of forgetting about things because everything melts in and just snap people out of it just for a second to just remember that like, ah, today, Tuesday afternoon to lunch or Thursdays, you mean uh, when you went to blah, 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 that was a son of a bitch of a moment. Yeah, that was. Yeah, you you are creating those. That's for sure. That's why we have to get people back in there. But not yet. Not till we're safe. Wait, there's a new one, um, blue in Bangkok, right? Yep. I hadn't seen that one yeah, before. It's, that's one of those ah, wow, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it's a, a kind of, What? No, no, it's oh. a, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice one. It's a again a, a beautiful adventure with Alain, who uh, uh, introduced us to a, a great family uh, and, and this kind of, I would say this company of strong, strong women. You mean this, the, uh, this chairman who's a woman and their whole team. It's probably, I think the first time I've ever worked on a project uh, that was almost 100% control, controlled and led by women. It's, it's got a different ambience not just one or two, but like the whole, the whole team. It, it, it was great. And, and you know, this, uh, this woman. You were telling me when we were having dinner. Ambition. Now I'm remembering, this is the project you were talking she about. She was a force. She was, she was, she was, she was, she was really, uh, she, yeah. she was really great. And then so for, for them, they had uh, very kind of strong ideas of what they wanted to create uh, over there in their uh, complex. So uh, we helped them out and just kind of made this, this trying to do this uh, restaurant that they wanted something that felt very French. So how do we mix modernity and some notion in the back of your head? In this weird ways, they had this uh, incredible view over uh, the river that goes through the middle of Bangkok. And there's this moment, you mean most of the time when you're dining because the sunset tends to be very regular over there at seven mm. o'clock in that part of the world where everything becomes blue. And then we thought this royal blue, this French royal blue. Beautiful. And there's a moment when the restaurant kind of disappears. It's wow. great. You know what I mean? There's this moment, it's like the blue, the inside and the blue, the outside, they kind of come together and the whole thing disappears right. and you just got this gigantic weird jellyfish installation on the ceiling that's floating in that kind of melts Beautiful. with the clouds and you're kind of, you know, you're just kind of weirdly kind of tipping on things. <laughs> and so before the champagne hits, we've already got you. What, how did, um, Patrick, how, do you, how did you make the, what you're calling the jellyfish, which is like di diaphanous, right? It's, di it's so beautiful, right? It's sometimes a, we have sometimes we have to do the the, the macgyver yeah you know what i mean sometimes yeah. it's kind of like i can't tell you the secrets but you know some chewing okay, gum well, I don't know the secrets, but, it, but it's a fabric right it's yeah. fabric yes yeah it's a fabric but it's a fabric it's some plexi it's a little bit of mirrors oh. in the back it's, oh yeah you know, i see the plexi yeah i see the plexi okay let's well, secrets secrets uh, you keep your secrets <laughs> no, um, be. So, look we, we wanted to talk we wanted to show some hospitality because we want to we want to send good vibes and good energy out to everybody out there. That's for sure. Um, I did want to show something that I is also quite new. This a, a building, um, an office building that you're working on, right? Yeah, we're working on uh, we're working on a couple of new buildings yeah. at the moment. One's happened to be here in Paris. It's a it's a beautiful uh, renovation of an old '60s building. Uh, that was kind of uh, protected here in Paris. And then what was its new partner going to be as the, our, our client to SFL who are, are, are really great risk takers uh, in, in the world of uh, Parisian developers uh, really wanted to kind of, you mean the, the um, uh, Hansel and Gretel is kind of this two combinations. So yes. we made this new building for them, kind of taking some of the uh, DNA of the architect who did the first building there you know, it's really great kind of going back to the 60s where you mean they tried to condense the people and give a bigger garden space and then give people kind of views and this penetration of interior and exterior. There's some of the fascinations of the 60s. So we, we take those ideas and prefabrication and, and concrete and everything else and we, we make a, a new building out of it. 
there is something very cool uh, about it is that you know in, in the 60s you will go to work with your car normal but now you 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 don't use your car anymore especially in cities and so to, to go there we we had two floors empty with a, a parking so we we took one floor for a, a office but so we dig we make big holes in the in the existing uh, project and we dig so the light can go inside and uh, we discover a new space and we know that everywhere on earth we had this uh, uh, project architecture pro project with uh, all this big parking lot uh, all this space given to cars that they will uh, we don't need anymore and we have to do something uh, with uh, all this uh, space waste space so we uh, we don't have to to go up we have to go yeah. down yeah uh, and, and then to, we, uh, to use so we take this garden and we begin to kind of terrace it down so then right. all of a sudden because the, the the problem about being in a, in a subterranean space is the the idea that the ground is above you we're not dead yet we don't want to be under the yeah. ground yet right, right? so th that's why you got to bring the ground to down to your feet again right and then there, there's ways that you can begin to do that so then you begin to benefit and profit from all that light and these walls of green which are great yeah i'm seeing and we are, I'm sorry and we are super super proud with this project because sanjit is an architect uh jack our other partner is an architect and uh, so we we drew this project uh and it's uh the second third big building we are uh, making but this one is in the middle of paris and it's uh it's it's great the we start construction uh, and we were there the other day uh with a view uh, just a crazy view on paris 360 degrees and uh, it was maybe two days before confinement wow wow well, I'll, I have, I'll, I'll, I'll have to send you a photograph. I'll send you a yeah. photograph because oh, it's yeah, I really to, I to quite, quite, know, quite, quite extraordinary. And what, I, I have a couple of images of it. I have to say, like something that you guys both do so well, and I'm sure together as partners, is is how to make something feel feel light and delicate. And hmm. you know, a building is a mass, but you but you manage to like carve it. Like it's almost like you're carving away from something. And it's and it looks and I'm looking at a shot looking overhead down at it, mm -hmm. and it sits, it sits like it should always have been there. It's so beautiful. I can't wait to see more pictures. Well, oh, thanks. So because well, we'll you know we're doing it, we're doing another one in Seoul in uh, in uh, Korea, a five story building, and you know it's funny that you talk about lightness. This obsession with kind of uh, uh, lightness. Uh, air, uh, the idea of uh, spatial qualities in, in nature. And so we're making a building where, I mean, the, the block is this big, but we're only using half of it as interior spaces. Mm. Half of it is exterior garden spaces and really kind of bringing these kind of seven hills of, uh, of, uh, of Korea and Seoul kind of into this building through these kind of vertical gardens. Uh, it'll be another very nice one. I'm looking forward to show it to you. Oh, good. I can't it's, wait. What do you have, Patrick? What's there? It's, it's very easy to do something light. Ah. You put tension. Ah. Tension in it. Tension in the drawing. Tension in the intention. Uh, when, when, okay, you just this, you give a force, you curve the space, and, and it's light. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Listen, first of all, I love seeing the two of you. I, you know, it's the instinct is we're going to get online. I'm going to see you together because that's how, you know, and then here we are all separated, but also just your relationship always comes out. Like, you know, you're always like so um, considerate of one another, which I find beautiful. Like you're like, no, you can, you, you talk about this project. It's really beautiful. And I think it comes out in the projects hmm. like that, that, beauty and also that deep deep humanity and um i want to thank you both for that and we'll get on the other side of it together somehow and um i'll be always cheering you on and being in awe and wanting to show it off um i love you guys thank thanks you. Love you. yeah yeah love yeah. you mm. for sure yeah god bless everybody
Great. And a uh, uh, big word to Alan Ducasse and his team, yeah. right? We will. Yeah. We will. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, everybody. not opening. Open up. <laughs> Yay! Here we go. Here we go. There we go. This house was built in 1966 or 7. The slight addition that was made was just this little bit here. And this owner wanted to keep the character of the house. So I see, Harry, so that's the this stair. This is the that addition. Made. There used to be a spiral stair there. This flooring here was the old decking. I love this. It does feel like we're outside. Yeah, yeah. I always say houses often don't need a lot of decoration. It's all out the window. You know, especially out here, which is so extraordinarily beautiful. I know it's got to be one of the most beautiful places on the earth. Where are we, by the way? We're in East Hampton we are, now. Okay. And, you know, 40, 50 years ago, when I had the office in New York, I would get in a car and see something being built at Fire Island, and I'd come out here, and then I'd go to Connecticut and then back to New York all in one day. Oh, really? I was younger then, you know, you could do it. <laughs> I started out in medical school. My father was a country doctor in North Florida, and it just didn't work. And an old family friend just said, why don't you be an architect? And so I thought, bingo, that's it. Well, when I left Chapel Hill and went 28 miles east to Raleigh, they had just changed the entire school of architecture. It became the school of design, as they called it. They had everyone there to lecture from Mies to Gropius to Wright. All of these people, you know, it was almost too much for a, you know, a young mind to take, but it was extraordinary, it really was. This is an important piece of property in my whole career. The original house was built in 1966, and then in 89, 90, this was built. Look at this, oh my goodness, wow. This was the first large house. I did 3,000 square feet. That was huge then, still big now to me. Your first was the one story, was one story. And it was a rough cut redwood house. Very open and spacious, only had two bedrooms in it. This has three. And right on Georgia Capon, huh? Mm -hmm. Years ago, we were so limited in what we had. And so that's why the houses were of rough cut cypress, literally right off the tree. So there were a lot of things that people liked in those earlier houses, which really just kind of cut through everything, just made it as simple and as straightforward. And listen, that's what, that's our business, right. I think. So Harry, you were saying the footprint of the houses back then didn't allow for three bedrooms, two bathrooms. Yeah. But I love that this feels like a big house, but you said it, it was is. how the width? 15 feet wide is all it is. 15. Wow. It is, that's all it is. But it, most people like it a lot. I like it yeah. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the client that you were building the, the homes for? They were all in advertising. Now they're all in the money management. Finance. Right? Finance, yes. I was between working at Richard Meyer's office and going to Harvard for my master's, and I decided to take the summer off and relax. And uh, shame on you. That lasted <laughs> about a week or so until I figured I needed to do something. I needed 
someone to come work. And I put the ad in the paper, which is about the only way we could do it back then. They didn't have all the internet things. And so I did. We really didn't talk about what needed to be done, but more just about design in general. And we sort of shared that same passion about design, which was exciting for me because of the generation you know, gap that we had. You know, for me, it's good design sort of transcends all the different ages. There's two structures that were existing on the property, and they're culturally significant, I think, to the East End and modernism, Andrew Geller's work. And when we were approached to do the project, they had to remain as they were. So it was, a, it was an interesting challenge, but I think one that Harry and I sort of enjoyed to try to actually complement them. We came up with an idea of a concept of sort of creating this path that connected the different areas of the property, but also the different structures. Let's go inside. <laughs> wow. We have a minimum of materials where it's the mahogany that originates as the deck from the Geller structure it comes and it, it sort of works its way through the site and becomes the floor, the walls, the ceiling. And I love this idea of the indoor, indoor outdoor. outdoor, right? Yes, yeah. that's something that we like to do a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's why people come out here is to be connected to nature. Yeah. Growing up in our household, it was a very art-based environment. You know, I was much more interested in the tectonics or the craft of things and building things, and I was always building things as a child. And so that sort of set me in a direction of being an architect. You ultimately chose to be out here because of the landscape, and I did as well. It's not only about the sort of the experience living aspect, but there's also the, the materials and the detailing of, of using the minimum means to have the, the most amazing experiences. This is amazing. Yes. There's so much glass to the house that we needed a way structurally to hold it down. And so this is the steel frame, and we turned it into one of the main features of the house where it has the skylight, it has a fireplace, and it's also one of the main mechanical systems for the house. These are BBs? BBs. Isn't it great? Amazing. This detail to sort of pick up the texture of the light coming in, but also some of the context in the area of the shingle home. That's so beautiful. These are serving carts that can be pulled out and moved wherever. I just love this detail. There's a place for everything, everything and everything in yeah, this place, it has right? To be, yes, it has to be. I think they complement each other yeah. so well. I mean, Harry just has such an amazing reputation out here. You know, starting from Fire Island and working east, and I mean, you've seen the houses that, that come on the market from 40 years ago. They're still relevant and people are still interested in them. And then Paul pushes us. Nothing's good enough. Mm -hmm. The first time we have to keep experimenting and yeah. keep pushing it. For this project, their program for us was to capture the spirit of Montauk in their house. We use a lot of native materials like bluestone and oak. You will notice when you look back this way, the sort of geometry of it, how the ridge doesn't go down, it goes that way. Yeah, so I, I love that. Takes your eye out there to that view. Wow. Sometimes I think about it, if we were the same age and practicing together, holy cow. Mm. But, you know, I think about it a lot. You know, try not to, can't even begin to say what I've learned from him. I mean, you know, 17 years ago, he gave me a good swift kick in the pants, which just started a whole new thing for me, which has been wonderful, you know? I thought I'd kind of fade away, man. Still here, <laughs> you know? <laughs>
Thank goodness, I thank you goodness, you know. <laughs> I think we both appreciate, and frankly is the reason why I'm an architect, and it's sort of creating experiences for people and sort of enhancing their lives and, and making it better. Our jobs seem to have a, a serenity to them, which is not a lot of stuff going on, you know. It's, it's there just, is, but you don't know it. You don't know <laughs> it. You know, you don't notice it. You're not supposed to notice it, you know. I know that each one is going to be different and better than the last. For us, we were able to find a niche that we were emotionally and mentally very satisfied with what we were doing. I guess since we've been doing it for so long, or at least for me. 17 years. Right? It's just together. sort of second nature. Ooh. 17 terrific years. Tune in tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for day two of the Hall of Fame Film Festival. More films, more design. See you then.